Welcome to the Future, otherwise known as episode 34 of Tomorrow's World Audit Time. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, Russ. How are you? Oh, barely, I see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, good grief, Mark. Yes, another another early start, another dawn chorus. Uh, it's practically dark when I woke today. But, you know, it, it, life's different now, Mark. Life is very different for me. I'm living, mm. I'm living the life of a maritime nautical sailor man. I think what... Uh, I've moved house, basically, is, is what I'm trying to say, Mark. I've moved house. Um, I think watching all of these boats on Tomorrow's World uh, has led me to aspire to the marine lifestyle. So I have moved to an island and mm. I now live in a fisherman's cottage, just mm-hmm. just a stone's throw from the ocean. Uh, you do? I it's do, all true. Yes. This is not a lie. <laughs> This isn't a bit. No. This is all true. He has done all this. I'm loving it, Mark. I'm loving it. And I, and uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I've already been you know ro- roaming around the harbour, giving out tips to to local mm-hmm. s- sailors. Yep. You know, showing them how they can use umbrellas to fix their hulls. Uh, you know, then mm. you know how magnets can show them where they're going and whatever other else boat stuff we've looked at. <laughs> well, I, I, I assume you're on the lookout for your own galley wife as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 And obviously, always combing the coastline for that that prime spot where we can finally <laughs> plant our oil rig. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be. I'm relying on it at this point, there, Russ. That, that's my that's retirement fund. <laughs> yeah, yes, but yeah. So if the acoustics are different this week, that's that's because I'm in a very different room. I think they might be better because I've actually got carpet in here, which is for the first time. Well, I say carpet. It's not carpet. It's uh, it's just underlay at the moment, but it still has the effects of carpet. Anyway, what time of year is it? Well, when I when when I planned this episode, it was of course fast approaching Halloween. But in our traditional mm. style, uh, we've actually zoomed past Halloween, and today is actually bonfire night. But let's ignore that <laughs> yes, it is. because I think we did bonfire night last year, didn't we? Was that a year ago? I think we did, didn't we? It was a firework display one, wasn't it? Was that bonfire night last year? It was the 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 the, the almost literal damp squib, wasn't it? Oh yeah, my God, the, it was a year the, ago. The QPR fireworks, bloody hell, yeah. Good grief. More, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> so I was thinking, what can we do? Any any sort of Halloween y thing we can do. I doubt tomorrow's world's ever covered Halloween. I mean sort of ghosts and things are very anti science, aren't they? But then I was think then I thought, ah, oh, who's the person who's who's the tomorrow's world presenter who most sort of encompasses Halloween? And I went through them in my mind and then I thought, mm. well James Burke uh, Burke is the, well, like one of the characters from Trapdoor. Is that mm. is that that's kind of Halloweeny, isn't it? That's got skeletons and stuff in it. I thought that's a bit tenuous. And then I rolled through them all. And then I went, ah, hang on a minute, Carol Vorderman. Carol Vorderman basically looks like Morticia Adams from the Adams Family, doesn't she? I mean, really, she's certainly the presenter oh, who looks yeah, okay. most like Morticia Adams from the Adams Family, as far as I'm concerned. She's got something of the night about her, I think. Certainly, when in her in the in her uh, 90s black hair fringe look phase so then i thought yeah okay let's pick an episode presented by carol vorderman we've not covered her before have we i mean i, I suspect she's probably going more for the angelica houston look than the morticia adams but you're not <laughs> wrong yeah. so yeah i mean we've not covered carol before no she has an interesting no. tomorrow's world history so all i did really was pick the episode of tomorrow's world closest to halloween presented by carol vorderman and that's what we've got it's the 28th of october 1994 and that is how the sausage is made. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any thoughts on Carol Vorderman, Mark, before I tell you all about her? Just that you and I were touching on this through through the notes and through some messages. I remember her joining Tomorrow's World being scandal ridden. My my memories were that because it was a big deal. It was a big deal when it was announced. It felt like you know like they poached her from Channel Four. Although I think she's still doing Countdown during this, isn't she? So it was a big deal, and it felt like so. You, you, you rightly pointed out that that Tomorrow's World had. I mean, it's your theory. You can tell it's like Tomorrow's World was a monarchy, as you put it down. Yes. Yeah. 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 Carol Vorderman. Yeah. Yeah. So the way Tomorrow's World always worked is it has an it has a, a line of succession. So mm. we had started Raymond Baxter because he, he was the he was the top dog, and then mm. he his second in command was uh, Willy Woolly, and then when Raymond Baxter stepped down, Willy Woolly took over, and then Willy Woolly's second in command was Judith Han, and then when Willy Woolly stepped down, Judith Han took over. So what would should have naturally happened when Judith Han stepped down is that Howard Stableford should have taken over because he was the next in succession, and then he didn't. So for some reason, BBC bosses decided to stick their oar in completely ruin protocol and go and 
poached Carol Vorderman. Presumably, uh, I couldn't find out how much it cost them to do that, but I presume probably a significant cost to, to poach her that would, would be more than just, you know, giving Howard a bit of a pay rise. And if I was Howard, I would frankly have been absolutely fuming. I'm actually quite surprised that he stayed on the job, really. I guess because he probably loved the job, that's why. But yeah, he must he must have been... Fu- I mean, Howard, if you're listening, please write in and tell us. Were you not fuming uh, <laughs> about the fact that they pushed you out of the way in favour of Carol Vorderman? I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Oh, how, how could he not have been? I mean, it's funny if I was thinking, as you were talking through your process there, I was thinking like, oh yeah, the, the one anomaly to this is like, is Michael Rod. But of course, like he was the court jester, so your model <laughs> still works. Yeah, I think so, because my, my, my memory was, like it was big news. It was designed to be big news. And it felt like one of those John Bertian style there's nothing wrong with this, so let's try and fix it. Yeah, and like this, this is a way of saying, "Oh, this isn't your, this isn't your dad's tomorrow's world." When at the time, actually, tomorrow's world was, was as we've discussed, is like it was still good. It's, it's still good, and actually, it's probably still getting good viewing figures. It's not getting 1970s viewing figures or 1980s viewing figures because nothing was getting those figures anymore. And obviously, now we look back at the viewing figures in 1994, and it's some kind of magical land where apparently everyone was sat in front of the TV <laughs> watching four things. Well, you know, because these days it's you know television is so much more fractured but yeah it really felt like th- th- it was a statement signing they were getting to uh, carol vorderman from countdown or you know in addition to my memory was that big money was involved or at least the you know the the illusion to big money was involved because there was a kind of a case in the right-wing media it's like oh how can the bbc justify this big money signing but i don't I, you know it's interesting you didn't find any numbers so maybe that was just chaff well but, i mean um, it seems like it seems that like carol's tried her best to scrub the whole thing from the internet to be honest <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair play to her. Because here's the thing. I was never terribly fond of Carol Vorderman. I didn't really watch Countdown as a child or a student. Never really loved it. Had a soft spot for uh, Richard Whiteley just because he seemed like a, such an avuncular figure. Twice not Never twice really. Twice Whiteley. Exactly. I mean, we all, you know, and, and his vast collection of blazers. <laughs> and um, But, like, I, I never really loved her. So, to me, you know, as somebody who enjoyed Tomorrow's World, I, it felt like, I don't know, it felt like a, an intrusion. And, you know, you have, I think, quite nicely put into a few sentences that there was a natural order to tomorrow's world that maybe you didn't think about but that your brain knew about and that clearly it was our boy Howard's turn mm. and he was overlooked and yeah I, I I would not be shocked if he was slightly furious but I think it is it is uh, obviously he, he, he gets there in the end but genuinely a fair play to him he must just have really enjoyed the show yeah and I mean uh, and, in, in and, this episode he's in he, he gets on go on holiday to America yeah maybe he, they, he's everywhere but the studio maybe they sweetened him up by giving him all the foreign trips but it, <laughs> possibly find out in future if that's the case yeah yeah indeed that will be interesting actually does he ever turn up in the studio and uh vorderman's there uh, and then of course the other thing about the vorderman thing is like it, it, in my mind it was like uh ridiculously short because obviously there was, there was the whole advert scandal thing but which i'm yes. sure we can come to you later yeah. yeah it felt like a mistake from beginning to end not in terms of like I, you know she's she's decent in this and actually she's unwell and she's a real trooper and i'm sure she was great and i'm sure she was lovely to work with but it's just what if it, it genuinely he felt like one of those looking back and thinking about it for the first time in a long time it did feel like one of those lord bird coming in trying to muck up the bbc because there was this feeling that revolution not evolution but i, I don't know it, it'll be interesting to hear to hear what you what you discover but yeah i mean because because you did watch countdown didn't you i think oh yeah 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 i used to watch that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it's just one of those things where nothing, <laughs> nothing else. Nothing. I mean, it was more sort of. Well, I've just finished watching. Oh no, wait. Which way around was it? No, it was on after fifteen to one. Was it on after or before fifteen to one? I can't remember now. But before, I remember there was. There was I, I, it was always I used a double to watch whammy. To one. I did not watch Countdown. Yeah. 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 But that was always a nice double whammy. I think fifteen to one and Countdown. But no, the other thing I was going to say is that you won't ever see Howard in the studio because that's the other thing that I think this series was a real downstep. Is it the, the the series immediately prior to this one? Is the is the one with Howard and Carmen and Judith and mm. Kate, mm. and that's the one that I think has the best studio. It has that yeah. enormous yeah. studio where they do really yeah. interesting things with it, and they have like and they they move between the different fa- parts of the studio, yeah. and it looks like they spent a lot of money on it, and it and it yeah, it's, it's really quite impressive. Well, there was there was the episode where they had an entire bus from Reading that smelled like chips, <laughs> yeah. along with a combine harvester, yeah, yeah. along with an entire fake field of wheat. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. Which is great stuff. And then they've in this series they've gone to old Carol sitting on a on a stool in a quite small room with a load of screens in it. And you think, oh, that's mm. a bit of a bit of a step down, isn't it? 
it reminds me of and, and everything's on vt and everything has an introductory title card and it really reminds me of it feels very american it feels very 60 minutes where yeah. like there is a nominal host who will stand in front of a green screen and talk to you for a few minutes about something and then there's an entire vt package that does not involve that host and yet you know it's still seen as you know they talk people talk about 60 minutes they talk about whoever the host is not the fact that it's made by all these other people who are really doing the work and it felt like vorderman had come in to be that presenter i suppose more in the original baxter style yeah yeah than than had tomorrow's world had become which is i suppose at some point tomorrow's world becomes a bit more like open university where they're jolly well going to show you show you an experiment to prove that what they're talking about is real yeah so this is a this is a style shift isn't it absolutely anyway shall i tell mm. you all about do carol vorderman mbe yeah. please do Born on Christmas Eve, 1960, mm -hmm. which means she's now 62 years old. And in this episode is 33 years old. Gosh. Which seems incredibly that young. Seems young. It seems so, so young. young it? It? Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> uh, she was born in Bedford to a Dutch father, Anton ah. Vorderman. So there's our Dutch angle, ticked off straight away. And a Welsh mother. But those two, those two separated uh, after three weeks after she was born. And then her mother and her moved to Prestatyn in Wales. So she considers herself Welsh rather than uh, Bedfordian. And she didn't see... Does any, her... does, sorry, does anyone consider themselves Bedfordian? <laughs> uh, she didn't see her father again until she was 42. But when she went on Who Do, Who Do You Think You Are, they looked into his background. And it turned out that he was a member of the Dutch resistance during World War Two, during the Nazi occupation. Uh, and also her great grandfather, Adolf Vorderman. Wow. I don't meet many Adolfs these days. Not many of them's the pound, are they? He played a key role in the discovery of vitamins. Oh. So, you know, you know, so Science runs in the family. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so what, she went to Cambridge, but she, I think, I suspect she probably partied too much. She seems like she's probably, from when I hear her in interviews, it sounds like she's a bit of a party girl. So yeah, so she only got a third in engineering in Cambridge. But I think probably even a third in engineering from Cambridge probably means she can still get quite a good job. But uh, I think she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Her first job, though, Mark, this is exciting. Her first job was a junior as a junior civil engineer at Dinorwig Power Station. Now, do you remember Dinorwig Power Station, Mark? We've had it is on the program the, uh, before. Is that the the one in the mountain? It's the one in the mountain. The one that wow. the one that was built specifically to deal with people turning on their kettles. T TV surges. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah, she used to work there, and then she moved to Leeds. And when she was in Leeds, she joined, which she briefly joined a pop group. As a backing singer called uh, Dawn Chorus and the Blue Tits, Jesus and the, the the lead the lead singer of Dawn Chorus and the Blue Tits. No, nope, don't like that name. Next, <laughs> the lead the lead singer of Dawn Chorus and the Blue Tits was the DJ Liz Kershaw. Oh wow! Uh, and they okay. they actually released songs. They even, they even did a peel session at one point, but they released a couple of songs, and I've got a couple of them here, so I thought I might play a couple of them to you. Oh, please do! They're all yeah. covers. So, so, so Liz Kershaw went as Don Chorus. Yes. And Carol was one of one the One of the tits. two blue tits, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so they did a cover of The Undertones Teenage Kicks. Wow, no wonder they got a peel session. John Peel was famously a huge fan of Teenage Kicks, wasn't he? It was his favorite it's song. his favourite song. Yeah. So I yeah, wonder what he yeah. thought of that. <laughs> um, it's not great, is it? And then singing's not great. <laughs> okay, what's next? And then this is a cover of Bruce Springsteen's "I'm Going Down."
I think that's but better that's, that I, one. That's, that's, quite, that's, that's better. Yeah. You know, they really remind me of the the two the two backing singers from Human League, but without the Phil Oakey bit. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that second one's better. I can't believe they didn't make it. I feel like with that one, they've they've made their own thing. They've made it their own thing. You wouldn't get yeah. that. You, it doesn't sound like they're just singing a cover version. It sounds like they've actually no done something with it. So, but yeah, obviously that didn't didn't really go very far. Uh, but meanwhile, the while while this is happening, she uh, Carol seems to be a person that does always seems to be doing two, at least two jobs at once. Her mum famously spotted an advert in the Yorkshire Post asking for a woman with good mathematical skills. And Carol obviously answered it as a woman with good mathematical skills. And at the age of 21, she got her first, uh, first TV job on Countdown. And obviously Countdown was famously the first ever program on Channel 4 in 1982. Uh, Carol obviously loved the job because she continued to stay on that program until 2008. By which time she was reportedly on an annual salary of £900,000. Mark, that's all right, isn't it? It's not um, bad at all, is it? Which she claims was three times more than Richard Whiteley earned, which is interesting. Hmm, that is interesting. Yeah. I suppose she did probably did do. Did she do more work than Richard? Did she do more work? Well, I suppose she used her brain more than Richard. That's not that's not a diss on Richard, but like he he read an auto cue and she actually had to she had to solve these things. Yeah, yeah. And well, speaking of using your brain, well, half them. Yeah. This is a very sort of a very multimedia heavy episode, Mark. But um, so I, I did find some quite interesting things, um, and I, I feel like I should show you what is considered to be the greatest numbers game answer in okay. countdown history. Have you ever seen this? Um, I don't know. I'll I'll tell you afterwards. It's an extraordinary piece of maths. One nine five two, then James. I think I have nine five two. Okay, well, that'd be great if you have nine five two. Gerald? 953. Oh, 953. Right, well, we've got a 953, Carol, and a 952. So let's have James's 952. Three times 100. Uh, sorry, can I do 100 plus 6? Okay, 100 plus 6, yes? Is 106. Yeah. Um, multiplied by 3. It's 318. Um, I'd like to multiply by 75 now. Multiply it by 75? Yes, please. Um, Multiply this by 75? Yes, please. Um, uh, and then divide it by something? Well, yes, in a minute, but... <laughs> okay, <that's laughs> I'm not quite clear what that makes, but that's certainly what I... I'd like to do 318 times 75. So times 75, and then what will you divide I'm going to take away 50. Oh, good grief, I'm going to need my calculator for this one. 318 times 75 um, is... Okay, <laughs> let's work it out. Um, 2 to 5 plus... 23,850, apparently. <laughs> okay, now take away 50. <laughs> 23,000, sorry, I've gone now. 23,800. And divide by 25, I hope. And divide this by... <laughs> <laughs> by 25. Yeah. Do you know, I think you're right. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> I think he's right. 952. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I, and I was thinking, because what's weird about that is that he doesn't appear to know what, what the sums are. He just thinks it's right. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, I, yeah. I looked, I looked in, somebody, but somebody in the comments explains this. Yeah. And the way they explain it is that he doesn't need to know that he, what he because he's all he's trying to do is he's trying to get a th he's trying to get a, th uh, a three i think or something like that but he knows because he's got a 25 a 50 and a 75 he knows the ratio between those three numbers yeah so yeah. he just has to multiply up and then divide back down again to get the number he wants so it doesn't matter yeah. what the number is that he multiplies up to because he knows the relationship between, between those three numbers got you right hence it's, his kind of doubt but he knows that his, yeah. his working out is correct even if he doesn't know the actual numbers yeah Oh, that's yeah. incredible. That is incredible. But I, I, I don't think anybody's ever else else has ever attempted. Well, I've certainly never heard of anybody else attempting it that way. But, no, uh, yeah. no, I've never seen that before. That, that's 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 uh, that's very smart. That's, that's what that's that's good countdown. They say they, they say Mark. That's good countdown. That's, good, <laughs> that's, right, that's yeah. good countdown. Yeah. So obviously, poor old Richard Whiteley passed away. Carol stayed on for a couple of people. She stayed on for Des Lynham and Des O'Connor, the two yeah. Deses. I don't know what it is about mm -hmm. the, the countdown job that attracts people called Des. Yeah, when old O'Connor retired, she was she was offered the presenting job, but they wanted to cut her salary by ninety percent. 
Uh, so obviously she told her, told her to stuff. Get, get the fuck <laughs> out of here. Yeah. Told her to stuff it. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I've always been slightly dubious about whether her, both her and Dent in Dictionary Corner, how they can always consistently get whatever the the best thing is, whether they get the best sum or the best word. And it's always seems it always seems to be like suggested that, that, that that's what they're doing. But apparently, in two thousand nine, Channel Four admitted something. Channel Four admitted that all countdown presenters have always worn earpieces, and that producers would sometimes supply extra ideas, as there are often multiple options to ensure viewers are given the best possible answers. <laughs> That's a... <laughs> I, I, I can see. Here's the thing. I can see how that would work with Susie Den because I think she is very good at words. But but I do. I have seen bits of Countdown where Carol Vaughan goes like, "No, nah, close as I can get is this." Yeah, and yeah, I haven't yeah. Worked it out. And and then later on, it'll come back as, "Yes, I have worked it out." And at that point, you think like, oh, "You and other people have worked it out." Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't care. Who cares? Yeah, God's yeah. Sake, people... But Carol was yeah. furious about this. She said that she never, she has never worn an earpiece or cheated in her. No, because we can actually hear the old man in the corner whisper in her ear what the number is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what else? I mean, besides Countdown, she's done loads of stuff that we would never watch. A lot of ITV stuff. Pride of Britain. I still don't know what Pride of Britain no. is. It's on every no, year, but it. she's always presented she's... that. Uh, Loose Women, obviously, she's she's on quite a lot. Uh, she's done a couple of the reality shows that we don't watch. Strictly, I'm a Celeb. Yeah. Don't um, watch those. M- more notably, she is our second how-to presenter that we've had, because obviously we had oh, Gaz, yeah. Gaz Top. That's right, yeah, yeah. So all we need is Fred Dynage to complete the... Complete the, 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 complete the set. Set the set. Unfortunately, I don't think Dynage would have ever presented Tomorrow's World. Would have been a good Tomorrow's World presenter, though, I think, of Dynage. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, do you remember this program? So, do you remember there was a program called Take Nobody's Word For It? doesn't ring a bell. No, this is show the thing. I want to show it to you. So yeah. I really liked this program when I was a kid. Take nobody's It was on word like okay. 87 to 89. Right. What? Which channel? BBC Two. BBC Two. It doesn't ring a bell. That, I may recognise it, but... I want to show you the theme tune. Because okay. if you remember, if you're going to remember it, you're going to remember the theme It'll tune. It'll be the theme tune, yeah. to make a huge bubble like this one. No, no, for the last time, in the science of soap bubbles is in a later programme. Oh. <laughs> Stand by for takeoff. Last time we asked you how this works. Why does this tiny propeller spin round and round? Oh, yeah, I do remember this. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. It is basically how-to, but on BBC Two, really. But I remember really enjoying it. I... I I always remember it as being presented by her and Richard Stilgo, but it turns out it wasn't Richard Stilgo at all. It was just some Richard other... Richard Stilgo alike. It was, just, yeah. Yeah, it was just like a more bald Richard Stilgo. He was apparently called Professor Ian Fells. I'd never heard, I'd never actually heard yeah. of him. I recognise him. I, I don't maybe, know he's, whether... maybe he looks like Stilgo. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether it's because that was the programme that... The only programme I ever sent off a stamp to drafts envelope <gasps> oh. for. You know. uh, it was it was like a whole kit of machines that you could make out of cardboard. I had it for years, and it, and it had the, the program logo on the front. So maybe because I had that episode, it just kept it kept it in yeah, my mind, yeah, which is why it, I always remembered it. Uh, but yeah, take nobody's word for it. It's the English translation of the Latin motto of the Royal Society. So that's where they got that from. But anyway, on to tom- Carol's Tomorrow's World tenure. Very brief. Presented it from the 14th of October 1994, so this is her third uh, episode, yeah. until the 2nd of June 1995. So essentially she did a, she did one series of Tomorrow's World. So I don't know whether she was actually technically sacked. I think that means that she didn't have a contract really, doesn't it? If she managed to get a full series out of her. Yeah, you would imagine that, yeah. Though it's, I don't know, you know, BBC works. <laughs> but yeah, it, maybe, maybe, to be fair, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked if she wasn't strictly speaking sacked. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, her references to her sacking in the odd newspaper article, anything like, and things like that. But there's no, there's not much. It's, it's not in her Wikipedia article, for example. But there, I did find a Guardian interview in 2005 where she she says getting the Tomorrow's World job in 19 in 1995 on BBC One. Well, that, I mean, she got that wrong immediately. It was 1994. Liar. <laughs> was a huge leap. 
However, it turned sour when they sacked me for doing aerial washing powder adverts, even though there was no clause in my contract barring it. Now, Mark, I'm gonna, I found the advert. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show it to you. And I'm yep. going to suggest that even though there was no clause in her contract, if I was her, I would have run it by the BBC bosses <laughs> yep. before going yep. ahead with it. Is this going to chime at my memory? <laughs> I think it probably is. Let's, 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 let's dip in, Russ. Uh, and basically, it turns out there's a YouTube channel called The Laundry Lab, the History Museum the History of Laundry, Museum. which has all of these soap adverts on it. So here we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Is this the powder of the future? They claim that new aerial future gives their best cleaning ever from the least powder ever. Can you believe that? I find it difficult. Smaller pack, smaller scoop, but better cleaning? I wanted proof, so I talked to the UK's largest independent testing and inspection group. We took 20 of the most difficult everyday stains, like makeup, gravy, clay, let them dry in for two days, and wash them as you do at home. This represents a difference we found on chocolate ice cream and mud. And what about the other stains? Of the 20 stains, Aerial Future cleaned significantly better on 14 and just as well as Aerial Ultra on the rest. So would I get the same results at home on heavy stains? Oh, yes. The test predict you get a significantly better cleaning performance. That is very impressive evidence. But what about the claim from the least powder ever? I asked the washing machine experts at Hoover. Well, our machines now use less water less electricity, so we're obviously in favour of using less powder too, providing it works. So with a pack that's so much smaller, do you still get the same number of washes? We tested it using the tiny scoop against the Aerial Ultra, and pack for pack it gave the same 22 washes. And the cleaning? Even better, so yes, it does work. I was looking for proof, and I believe I may have seen the powder of the future. That is astonishing. Come on. I, I did, I, that, that is basically a one-minute VT segment <laughs> from Tomorrow's World. And also, and she even starts standing in front of a... Yeah, a big wall a big of screens. A big wall of screens, yeah. just like the... Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say, the most recent one I can think of is uh, the reason, I, I, as a uh, MasterChef professional, Marcus Waring is brilliant. Yeah. But oh. it's it was it was Michel Roux Jr. And he got fired, yeah. not because he advertised potatoes, but because he advertised potatoes in a style that was similar to MasterChef the Professionals. Yeah. And the BBC don't like it when you basically leverage the style of the show that you present because it confuses people. It confuses idiots, but yeah. it's, you know, it's taking the piss. That's it, what is it is taking the piss. It is. It's yeah, taking yeah. the piss. Yeah. 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 So sorry, Carol. They had you absolutely bang to rights there. That bang is, to rights. Is, yeah. You just can't do stuff like that. No. Especially as... Oh, did she not think it any... Because she's smart. She must have realised. Or agency or somebody. Yeah. I, I mean, and especially as we know, Mark, the, the, Tomorrow's World's ruthless uh, <laughs> pursuit of non-advertising that they've had Absolutely. throughout the years. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, 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 a real, it's a real, you know, hot button issue for them. I was thinking that as I was watching it there... How excited would you be if you went round a friend's house and they uh, just randomly opened up like their cupboard full of cleaning stuff and it was all the packaging from the 90s and they just never mentioned it. They just happened to have all this retro <laughs> looking. I think I'd lose my fucking shit. I'd well, be amazed. That's it. I mean, one of, my, one of my greatest birthdays out I ever had was the day that I, <laughs> I spent my birthday going to the Branding and Packaging Museum. In, it's in Notting Hill, I think, or somewhere near Notting oh, Hill. wow. Oh my god! I hope it's still there. Everyone at home, if you if you have you know a couple of hours, go to the Branding and Packaging Museum. It's incredible. But mm. the it's 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 like Marcel Proust is absolutely smashing yeah, you around yeah, the head yeah. with a baseball yeah. bat as you walk He's around. Fingering this. the back of your brain <laughs> grapes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. Oh yeah, extraordinary day out. Anyway, yeah. So Carol didn't learn from this. Well, I mean. She basically committed another huge advertising boo-boo a few years later when, in 2006, there was a charity's tragic called Credit Action, which she it was just sort of against, oh, yeah. against uh, pe like, people who can't afford it using credit. They had a go at her because she'd been endorsing a debt consolidation firm called First Plus, which she'd been doing for 10 years. Uh, and Credit Action like, called her out and said, look, these debt consolidation firms are absolute rip-off. They're charging huge interest rates and all of this. And you... Loan sharks, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you shouldn't, Allegedly. you shouldn't be using your status as a famous mathematician to be you know, selling stuff which is mathematically awful for, for these people. 
Carol, absolutely unrepentant once again, uh, she said, the secured loans market was criticised. It was pertinent to pick me out because I was a face. I advertised First Plus for 10 years. We had something like £1.5 billion out on loan. And until a matter of months ago, there were no repossessions. When that programme, BBC's Real Story, was made, there were no repossessions. Did they say that? Funnily enough, no. So yeah, Carol doesn't care. Inter- interesting that she says we. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then in 2009, David Cameron appointed the head of a task force looking at the teaching of mathematics. And when she was appointed, she mocked Labour's education policies. So, I mean, at this point, I think everyone is assuming that old Carol uh, was a bit of a Tory. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she had all of the, <laughs> you know, she was walking the walk. All, all the bona the fides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were all there, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> but she's always described herself as politically independent. And and obviously these days, I don't think anybody would accuse Carol of being a Tory, would no. they? Yeah. No, <laughs> she's yeah, she's had she's sort of this second wind in life as some sort of left wing firebrand. Uh, yeah, you know, re- it's very amusing. Yeah. Reading her Twitter feed, you might as well be reading Owen Jones' Twitter feed, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, more power to her, I say. I, I am slightly worried that she's she's just got just on the cusp of uh, you know these people have just reached the cusp of having work done where you think don't go any yes. further, don't go any yeah, yeah, further. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah, all right yeah. now. Yeah. You look fine now. But... Now, now you can coast. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You don't want to go full madge. <laughs> yeah. So two last things about Carol. She's yet another Tomorrow's World presenter who's a fully qualified pilot. And she's the only person to win Rear of the Year twice in wow. 2011 and 2014. Gosh, later in life. Do you know they've Very not had good. a Rear of the Year since 2019, Mark? I don't know. What... COVID, Russ. COVID. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to look like a COVID arse, do you? No, you do not. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, Russell, if you said to me, can you believe they had a Rear of the Year up until 2019? <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have been equally as shocked. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's Carol Vorderman. Interesting character. But shall we ever look at some uh, let's some have proper a some proper tomorrow's worlds? Let's let's get in. Good evening and welcome to tomorrow's world. Tonight, Shahnaz Pakravan puts an extraordinary flameproof material to the ultimate test: childbirth without pain. Vivian Parry witnesses the delivery of baby Anna using a controversial new technique to fight the pain. And disaster in the air. The invention that lets you live to tell the tale. But first tonight, tanks. And please excuse me if I sound a little hoarse. Now, this summer, the troops of the United States Army got their strangest orders ever to throw 60 of their tanks into the Gulf of Mexico. Why? Because marine biologists say it's good for the sea life. Howard Stableford unravels the fishiest of tales. Dauphin Island, Alabama on America's Gulf Coast in high summer. Plenty of people think this is the place to come. Sailors, sun worshippers, him, even cowboys. But the people who love this place most of all are fishermen. Americans are fishing mad. It's a massive industry. It brings in billions of dollars every year. And the fishing here is good. In fact, it's very good. These people are just reeling them in all day. The reason for their success is that the boat captains know exactly where to find the fish. They know that red snapper hang around reefs, so that's where the paying customers, fishermen and fisherwomen, are taken. And divers. Thousands come here every weekend. And when divers step off the boat, what they want to see are wrecks, reefs and fish. The bad news is there aren't enough reefs. Most of the seabed around here for hundreds of miles is the marine equivalent of a desert. Now fish don't like this seabed because it's flat and featureless. Nowhere to feed, nowhere to shelter. 
are no protected areas where they can breed, but everything can be improved, and that's exactly what local fishermen caught on to. They started building their own reefs, illegally, out of anything that they could lay their hands on. Old trucks and cars were particularly popular. With more places to breed, the fishing improved so much that before long the state government got in on the act. And today, 1,000 square miles of seabed has been set aside for the building of artificial reefs. But there's a problem. In seawater, anything made of steel rusts fast. A reef made of old cars might be gone in less than five years. So Alabama State was looking for something which would last a little bit longer. By a happy coincidence, the US Army was wondering what to do with a few tanks. What with the Russians being so friendly, they had 3,000 of them spare. Trouble is, you can't give them away these days. Even scrap merchants won't touch them because, being tanks, they're rather hard to break up. No one could ever have imagined the peace dividend would look like this. Ten miles offshore, America's first line of defense against Soviet world domination is about to become a home for fish. So here it is. It looks like an environmentalist nightmare. This M60 tank, along with 20 others, all veterans of the Vietnam War, are about to begin their final push to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, the environmentalists couldn't be happier. All these tanks will ever do is gently rust, because anything that would pollute has already been drained, scrubbed off, or steam cleaned away. This has got to be the most surreal experience of my life. I'm 26 meters under the gulf on a US Army, a US Army tank. From here, it's as if two totally alien worlds have somehow collided together. Now the thing is, whereas cars may only last for five years, this should last for 75 years. Now this is one of those rare things, Mark. This is a segment that I remembered completely from when I first saw it. Amazing. I think I must have just been taken with the idea that they were sort of um, using weapons of war to create life sort of thing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as a young, impressionable person. And I just, I, I completely remembered that image of those tanks going off the side of that boat and dropping into the water. Uh, the what I didn't obviously consider at the time is that this is just... <laughs> it's just industrial dumping. They're just dumping. This is just, it is. Yeah. They, yeah. This is this is one of the most incredible bits of I don't know. It's not greenwashing, is it? What would you call it? I, the, what do you call it when you make something that would otherwise be considered bad somehow virtuous? I don't know. Like... Fraud. <laughs> I mean, greenwashing isn't bad. No, no, no. It's a this good is, phrase, yeah. They've somehow managed to make industrial dumping yeah. virtuous. It's amazing. I mean, obviously it works. I can, I, you can see it works, yeah. it, you know. But they are just dumping. <laughs> yeah, the, the US Army are laughing into their face. <laughs> <laughs> before we get into this, Mark, I just want to see this segment opens with what, I mean, I'm going to say it, it's clearly the best piece of music of the episode, um, which is uh, Swamp Thing by The Grid. Uh, a, a song which I maybe I remembered, but in my mind had, had sort of been completely wiped out by. Ah, uh, oh, I see. Now nah, that, that's interesting. Cotton Eye Joe. I, 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 inst I, in I instantly knew what it was because I, I felt like I heard it so often in 1993, 94, whenever it came out, that actually I don't like listening to it anymore. <laughs> So for me, when Johnny comes marching home is, I think, the best ah. music of the piece. Yeah, oh, we have to discuss that later. Yes, then. yeah, yeah. The only reason I wanted to bring up the music in particular is, um, have you seen the music video to it, Mark? Is it the weird uh, CGI? With yeah, the... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, because yeah, yeah. I, I know I know the song, Russ. I told you. I just, <laughs> the, these CGI men, let's skip to them. Hang on. Yeah. These little CGI men.
Is that the most nineties? Uh, oh, easily, yeah, possible? yeah, or early nineties, yeah, 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 definitely. But did do you know that one of the grid was also one of Soft Cell? Did you know that? I I did not know that. Russell, uh, please don't assume my knowledge of the grid <laughs> is a- anything more than me just knowing the song before you did. Uh, no, I did not know that. They were a member of the so- of Soft Cell. It was the it was the, it was the, it was the, the member of Soft Cell that's not Mark Armand. Was, <laughs> I was going to assume was, was the otherwise you, otherwise you would have said it was Mark. Yeah, Armand. was the most famous person in yeah. the grid, and then yeah. he was with another bloke called Richard Norris who wasn't really anything else and that get that banjo player was a man called Roger Thinsdale who was just so a bloke that wasn't sampled no no he's a real oh. was, uh, but he was an unsigned artist he was just a bloke who played in Irish pub bands oh. they, they, they obviously heard him play and they said oh do you want to come and play on this absolutely insane banjo rave track this, that we've made this horrific tune that we're uh, birthing <laughs> no, I think this song is brilliant Mark I, I, I know I do, I do get your point it is it is kind of fun but I just I heard it a lot I think I, I, right, like, rave and banjo should be combined more often they're, 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 the, they're the two types of music that make you want to dance the most you know you're just covering all your bases there but yeah NME ranked that as the 41st best song of 1994 so there you go okay what was the number one song I don't know I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, sorry, I shouldn't ask you these questions. <laughs> yeah, never ask follow-up questions. Bart. Sorry, Russell, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But yeah, no, so yeah, I mean, this segment obviously opens with Howard amongst my people. It's an absolute, <laughs> just an absolute yeah, yeah, sea of, of boats. There's boats as far yeah. as the eye can yeah. see. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and Howard says that the Americans are absolutely, what did he say? You're absolutely mad for fishing? Fishing mad. Fishing, fishing mad. mad. Americans are fishing mad, Russ. Yeah, and you questioned this, didn't you? You questioned, are they fishing mad? It wasn't that some Americans aren't fishing mad. I know that's true. Myself and Josie have been to the Memphis Pyramid, which is the world's largest pro-bass fishing shop. <laughs> and, it, and actually is is truly, genuinely, one of the most remarkable places I've ever been. This, this you know, 10-story pyramid on the outskirts of Memphis that you go in, and it is it is a bit like... um. It's it's like going into the crystal Hang maze on. where like there's an entire zone. I've seen I've yeah. seen that pyramid. I didn't know I didn't realise that was a pro bass fishing shop. Is yeah, what? have you ever seen the Yeah, I'm serious. That's, <laughs> and it's a hotel. And and I was kind of angling for us to stay there, but it was just too expensive really to justify the cost. Not least because your window looks into the pro bass fishing which is like, you know, it is like there are all these different zones. It is an incredible place to walk around for about an hour. Yeah. Um I, I've never seen so many uh, duck decoys in my life, Ross. <laughs> And you can imagine all the clothes I think would have suited me to a T. Absolutely, no, yeah. it, was a, it was a it was a cracking place. I I absolutely know that there are fishing mad Americans. What I am suggesting is that all Americans are not fishing mad because I have also been to other places outside <laughs> Memphis, like I don't know, for example, the entirety of New York City, where I, there probably isn't a single fisher person amongst them. <laughs> Maybe except for the except for the Fisher King, and that's the only time I've ever heard <laughs> fishing in New York in the same sentence. Yeah. So I just thought that was a little bit, you know, it's like because the thing is, you don't need to go over with America. You don't need to say they're all something because the, the because because some Americans are mad fishermen and fisher women. The sheer numbers involved are still so huge. You don't need to exaggerate them. <laughs> and, and so that that just like it's like you don't have to go overboard, Howard. I, I would imagine everyone in Louisiana is is fisher mad because obviously you know and, and Tennessee and everywhere all along the Gulf and I know there are places that have lakes but like there, there's a significant proportion of Americans who probably hate fishing as much as most people hate fishing <laughs> Do you want some stats, though, Mark? Do you want some stats? I would. I would. I, Russ, Russ, blow me out of the water in, with your new uh, ship home. I'm ready. I'm ready to. I, re- I read a report from 2019 all about the American fishing industry. Yeah. In 2019, how many people in America do you think had fishing licenses? Uh, it, it, numbers or proportion of the population? Numbers. Uh, 320 million. Or, or proportion. Either. I've got both. Uh, like a tenth of the population would still be 32 million. So let's say 30 million. 50.1 million, which is one in six of the population. All right. Although not everyone bothers getting a license. So the yep. estimated total number of anglers is estimated to be 74 million. Okay. Their annual spend on the hobby is over fifty-one billion dollars. <laughs> that is a lot of money, but that's a lot of Americans. Don't get me wrong. It supports eight hundred twenty-six thousand jobs and generates yeah. sixteen point four billion in tax revenues. More yeah. Americans fish than play golf or tennis combined. That does not shock me. And if all these fish, it's cheaper, if all these anglers formed their own country, it would be the thirtieth largest country in the world, just ahead of notorious fish thieves, Spain. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but I would remind you that what was it? Roughly uh, four fifths of the population don't fish, <laughs> which would be a much larger country <laughs> us, <laughs> by your logic. And apparently they're leaving on the table some apparently two hundred and fifty billion dollars a year on spend on fishing. <laughs> I did also saw a very detailed breakdown of um of like their expenditure, like things like mm. they spend seventy two million dollars on binoculars alone. Uh, 186 million dollars on magazines, but the the best wow, the best that's ridiculous. The best figure I saw is that they spend seven million dollars on taxidermy. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, like a bit of taxidermy art. Whereas in the in the in the UK, it's around 1.6 yeah. million people with fishing license, and uh, they make about 1.2 billion pounds. So, but I I would argue there is there is, there is definitely a difference between UK and US fishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, think like there's the... no such thing as a pro bass shop in Britain, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a giant pyramid. No, there isn't. No, no, there isn't. It's like it is. You, you know, I, I associate the people I know who fish. And I don't know many, but like when I did, and they've explained it to me, it's it's almost like it's meditation. Whereas in America, it is hunting. They they are they they don't, they don't fish. They hunt fish. Yeah. You know, uh, and you know that, that's that that's why they need binoculars, Ross, is because you know <laughs> the idea that you would just sit there and wait for fish to come to you is such an anathema. <laughs> You you have decided you're going to use long distance lenses to look at the surface of the water that you can't see through for the mere sign of a fish. So so thirsty is your blood for the you know the yeah actually it's a completely different thing. Now you say it like that, you'd think rather than binoculars, reverse periscopes would be the best thing to the to oh, buy. Yeah. To be to be fair, when we saw some of the boats, like they all come with like sonar and stuff like that. Like they are kitted up to the nines. Oh, and there's a beer cooler, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but anyway, Howard is um, on board this boat. He's uh, wearing a polo shirt, which looks exactly like one of the polo shirts from the Britass Empire. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And then he gets changed into a wetsuit. And did you notice how much trimmer Howard looked when he was in a yeah, wetsuit than when he was in a polo I, I, shirt? I did. He's quite svelte. I yeah. always think those polo Suits shirts him. make people look fatter than they are. Then he goes underwater to show us these some of these sunk tanks. And he's wearing this quite interesting sort of old school sort of... It's not wearing scuba gear. He's wearing this old school tank on his mm. head. Um, like a, it's almost like an old school diver would wear. Mm. But it's quite clever because it does allow him to talk to us. And he's definitely is... Mm. I think this is the first time mm. we've ever seen somebody actually talk to us underwater. And it, and it yeah, clearly be them. Um, yeah. So I guess maybe that's what that... Maybe that's a special being able to talk underwater helmet. Well, I can only assume that it, because I was looking at it, it's like he, he turns it when he's breathing in. Yeah. And then he, he flips it again when he's breathing out, which then is obviously when he is talking. So it, it must literally just be a valve that allows the the, the air go in one direction. It's quite a lot. I, I, cause the thing is, like, you'd, you'd want to make sure you're getting it right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to die. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's odd though because it because it, it just it, I, for a long time I thought it was the most over engineered head garment <laughs> on this show until, until until we get to later on. Yeah, yeah, because it, because it is it's quite it's quite a serious bit of kit. And actually, the image of him standing on this tank because because he is standing, he's he's wearing this weighted belt, so he's obviously sunk down and he is just standing there. It, it's it's quite it's quite it's quite a great image actually. Yeah, and I, they, I mean these these tanks. I could say they they're getting the, the army getting rid of them because well yeah. there's there's going to be no more wars in the world anymore Mark that's the thing the, yeah. the, fr- the friendly Russians do you call them friendly Russians doesn't he? he does yeah the friendly Russians what what with the Russians being so friendly yeah 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 and so well don't need them anymore just chuck them in the sea let the fish live in them what a what a be- beautiful utopian idea that is Mark <laughs> yeah absolutely if you were a fish. Uh, which part of the tank would you would you most like to live in? I I know you put dibs on the um the cannon, didn't you? I think maybe the barrel of the gun, surely. I mean the barrel of the gun, yeah. I think I probably want to be on the the bigger on the inside because I imagine on the inside there's lots of little alco, so like you'd always kind of find like a little flat. Yeah, a little flap on the yeah. inside. A little, little flat, a little a little apartment, a little mini apartment inside. Yeah, yeah. So like a gated community. That's that's what I'd go for. I think. Oh, no. Yeah. These tanks, Mark. They're M60 tanks. Do you want to know about the M60 tank? I do because it was he was confused like he seemed to be implying they were going to be on the front line against Russia but then he also said that they were only really using the Vietnam War but, <laughs> so yeah I would love to know about them yeah I, I mean Howard's all over the place with this I, I, I looked into it the, the tank was put into operation by the US in 1960 but it didn't see any frontline service in Vietnam so I don't know what he's talking about there oh okay it's first use in combat and this is quite topical Mark it's first use in combat was used by Israel in the 1973 Yom Kippur War 
That was the wow. first time it had you know, combat operations. And then it was used in various a few other things. And its largest deployment was during the Gulf War. Uh, it was one of the main tanks that um, busted Saddam. And then once um, once old Desert Storm finished, it was retired from the front lines. So it didn't do you a huge amount. It just kind of was there on standby, waiting for a war to start uh, and only getting involved every occasionally. Uh, but its most famous, well, I'd say, I, it's probably its greatest achievement, Mark, is that, do you remember the Sandy, uh, 1995 San Diego tank rampage? I do, I do, Russell, yeah. I've yeah. got a film of it here. It's 1995. Grand Theft Auto hadn't even been invented, and this man was living Grand Theft Auto. 58 tons of war machine on a rampage in San Diego. An apparently depressed, out-of-work plumber locked inside. 34-year-old Sean Nelson had been a tank crewman in the Army, but police had no idea who was at the controls until it was over. He's been talking to his neighbors and friends about suicide, and uh, also having going through some bad times, no money. Nelson stole the M60 tank from a National Guard armory. The gate was open. He broke into three locked tanks. Unable to start the first two, he wasn't noticed till he rumbled away in the third. There was no ammunition in the tank, but Nelson left a trail of crushed cars, broken utility poles, and gushing fire hydrants before rumbling onto the freeway in another improbable California chase scene. It was bizarre enough to appear almost comical at times. His head was like out of the tank, and he was yelling, Plumber Bob. But it wasn't. He knew that it was trying to kill us. Nelson did not seriously hurt anyone before getting hung up on a freeway barrier. Police managed to open a hatch as Nelson maneuvered to free the tank, refusing to surrender, and not knowing if he had a weapon, police said, they shot and killed him. The streets of American cities are often described as combat zones. No wonder. If Nelson hadn't hung up himself, police said, another tank might have been the only way to stop him. Reed Galen, CBS News, Los Angeles. Extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, OJ, eat your heart out. That's a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a highway chase, that is, isn't it? Mm, I mean, and the great thing well. is we, we can celebrate it because he didn't hurt anybody. So that is just... Uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't realise he, he was just shot to death, though, by the police. But I mean, I, I get it. Like, you don't know anything. But crikey, that, like it, that was a bit sad. Well, that's the interesting thing. So I, I, yeah. I read it read about because I was thinking, how do they shoot him? He's in a tank. And apparently yeah. a copper jumped on there with bolt cutters and managed to cut the top open. And then he started spinning the, the the gun around to try and shake him off, and then so then he shot him. But then you think, hang on a minute, surely surely ta- surely tanks should be bolt cropper proof. Yeah, why, yeah. why, why doesn't this happen on the battlefield? Yeah. Also, like apparently, just a, the the road median will just be enough to. Start <laughs> yeah, it yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it, like obviously the comments, but in the YouTube video, are just full of pe- people like making GTA comments. Well, one of them I like to say, you can you can see the exact moment he goes from two to five stars. <laughs> 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 uh, made me chuckle. Yeah, so they're dumping these things in these tanks in the water, uh, Mark, and they said they're going to last for fifty years because they take so much longer to rust than cars. Interesting. Seventy-five. Oh, seventy-five years. Sorry. Seventy-five. Yeah. And it, and interesting that it turns out they've already just been dumping cars in there, isn't it? You know? Yes, that would, that's that's the yeah yeah. And you and I both have the same idea, which is like that's not why they dump the cars. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, there's probably some food in the boot for the fish as well, isn't there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So. I thought, well, th- does this still exist? You know, or was this just a one-off? In theory, it should be there until 2060. And it does still exist. I mean, if you look at the bottom of the of the thing, there's a, there's a photograph of a of, of yes, one of the I tanks did see there. That, yeah. You see, there's I think it's, 19, well, it's from 2019 that photograph. So there's still you know still in reasonable shape. There still looks like a tank, a bit more sort of fur very identifiable. Yeah. And people, yeah, people go down there and dive and look at them. Have they continued doing this? Oh my God, Mark, have they continued doing this? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. It turns out actually that this was not the first time they they thought of doing it, and they've been doing it over the years. And actually, all of the states around the Gulf, it's essentially it's it's some sort of thinly veiled way of just dumping everything in the sea and pretending mm. that it's a good thing. So, so Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, they all do it. Um, I mean, Alabama actually started doing the first time Alabama did it was in 1953 when they chucked 250 cars in there, claiming that it was making a reef. Over the years, they've dumped um, bridge rubble, barges, boats, airplanes. Recently, they chucked a couple of boilers from from a power station in there. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, basically, if it if it sinks, they just slap a label on it saying uh, reef fish, <laughs> fish, <laughs> fish, homes. fish house, and chuck it in yeah. the ocean. What what did make me laugh though, Mark? Is there's there's another U.S. state which has a extremely a possibly larger reef creation program than any of these others and do you know which US state that is it's nowhere near the Gulf I was about to say uh, if it's not Florida or on the Gulf then it must be some landlock think of a state that would have lots of uh, waste contractors in it that might need to Shut illegally up, get rid Jersey? of yeah, yeah. New, Jer- it New Jersey New Jersey dumps <laughs> Oh my god! So much oh, in there. Like, this is no longer a pet theory. Like, this is now a hard fact, isn't it? They're just yeah, dumping yeah. bodies. <laughs> <laughs> They've got reefs galore off the coast of New Jersey. Oh that that place god. where famously everyone loves to go scuba diving. It's a, it's real scuba diving <laughs> heaven out there, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. But then I was and then I I was looking. What has this always been? You know, it's always been a great idea. And then I found apparently it was a famously an attempt in 1974 to build an artificial reef um, off the coast of Florida for Fort Lauderdale. And they're going to call it, they called it Osborne Reef. <laughs> and some, and it, <laughs> see, you see when you see the problem in this idea. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> <laughs> they decided to make their own. So obviously I've been saying these, these artificial reefs have been made out of tanks, uh, old boats, rubble, you know, things like that. In yeah. 1974, they decided to build a, a reef off of Fort Lauderdale out of old tyres. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> and obviously tyres, I mean, they're, they're kind of floaty. So what yeah. they so what they did was they... What did they fill them with? <laughs> well, no, they decided to lash them together into bundles yeah. on the grounds that the bundles would, some, would sink, more likely to sink. It would magically sink, yeah. But they lashed the bundles together with steel cable. <laughs> Oh stop! So they, so these tires just randomly appeared. So they they dumped thousands upon thousands of these bundles in, into the ocean, and in in total, it was two million tires they dumped in, wow. into the ocean. And in fact, they got support from Goodyear. They dropped a golden tire off of the Goodyear blimp to mark the opening of it. Right? Obviously, the steel cables corroded within <laughs> months. Mm. So then you've suddenly got two million tires that are not lashed together, just bouncing around in the ocean. It covered 36 acres, and it was only 70 feet away from an actual coral reef. And now suddenly all of these tires are bouncing around. They smash into the coral reef, oh, start yeah, destroying yeah. the real coral reef. And then for 30 years afterwards, on America's east coast, there was just tires washing up on the beaches. Thousands of Every time there's a hurricane, thousands of tires would wash up on the beaches of North Carolina and, and Florida. They... <laughs> It's absolutely environmental disaster. That's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> and I, so then in 2007, the, the military realised it'd actually be quite good training for their divers if they just started to send their divers down to, you know, oh, train you in diving, go and collect us some tires from this yeah. absolute yeah. nightmare site. And within two years, they, they managed to collect 73,000 tires. There's a lot of tires, isn't it? But, I mean, it's mm. it, there's two million of them down million. there. million, yeah, that's... Not so, enough, is it? <laughs> but brilliantly, those seventy-three thousand tires. You know what they did with them? They took. They took. No. They took lorry loads of them to Georgia, where they got shredded and then burnt for fuel in a paper mill. <laughs> oh, causing okay. even more pollution. Brilliant. <laughs> So that so that worked. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, in 2015, Florida employed an industrial diving firm, and they've been removing between two and five thousand tires per week. So they've removed a total of 250,000 tires. Great stuff. <laughs> they've, still, so, they've still got loads and loads yep. to go. Still got seven-eighths of the tires to go. <laughs> I just think it's astonishing that anyone thought that building a reef out of tires would be a good idea. Like, and the fundamental properties of, of rubber are like, what, what are they they're thinking? They're quite well known. Yeah. They're quite well known. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So this, but what Howard's looking at here, actually... Pretty good, pretty good success. I mean, yeah, you can go down there. Uh, fishing industry in Alabama's doing really well. Um, can't really fault it, apart from the fact that really someone needs to hold their hands up and admit that they, all they are doing is just dumping shit in the sea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is okay. Yeah, it's all right. Just, but you know, don't lie. <laughs> just admit it. Yeah. I mean, at least I know. I know. I know. He makes the point that at least they like they're they're scrubbed clean. You know, like and everything dangerous is removed. But ultimately, you are just dumping tanks. 
mm. in the water. And it, to me, it, especially when you watch them go in, as satisfying as it is, <laughs> it's it's when you watch them being pushed into the sea. Like, you can almost imagine everyone doing just kind of, like, looking left to right to make sure no one's really <laughs> yeah, spying them. Because yeah. it looks dodgy as all fuck. That's yeah, like, it, yeah. it is so clear what is happening. Yeah. Oh, and you're, you're like, Louisiana and Texas, you'll never guess what they tend to dump in the sea for their reefs. Guns? <laughs> <laughs> Oil rigs. Oil rigs. Yeah, yeah, of course yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I should have guessed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's it for uh, fish tanks. Unless you have anything else to say, Mark? Nope. Let's go. Nine months ago on Tomorrow's World, we met Nicholas Carter. Born profoundly deaf, Nicholas underwent a pioneering operation known as a cochlear implant, which allowed him to experience sounds for the first time. But that was just the start. The struggle to make sense of what he's hearing will take many years. Yesterday, the British Deaf Association expressed strong reservations about the value of implants for children. So in this National Deaf Awareness Week, we went back to see how Nicholas was getting on with his implant and to hear him speak his first words. Today is Nicholas Carter's fifth birthday, and for the first time he can enjoy the sights and sounds of a birthday treat. Slowly but surely, his life is changing. It all began last autumn when Nicholas and his parents arrived at Nottingham General Hospital. First, Nicholas had to be tested to find out whether he was eligible for the operation to have an electronic ear implanted inside his skull. There's a waiting list, so only the profoundly deaf qualify. With Nicholas, if he's wearing the most powerful hearing aid in the world and we held a, a pneumatic road drill next to his ear without a silencer on it, he would not be aware that it was there at all. Nicholas was selected and in January this year he went for the operation. The cochlear implant is an electronic device which converts sound into electrical signals. In a four-hour operation, the electrodes on the implant were fed into his inner ear to stimulate his hearing nerve directly, bypassing his faulty cochlea. Three weeks later, the external elements were fitted, including the microphone, which picks up the sounds and feeds it to the implant inside his skull. Then came the moment of truth, when, if it worked, Nicholas would hear sound for the first time in his life. Good boy. Well done. Good job. Very good. It's now nine months since Nicholas's implant was switched on. He was one of the first children in Britain born deaf to have a cochlear implant. Now, every child reacts differently to their new world of sound. So we've come back to his hometown to find out how things have changed for Nicholas and his family. He isn't yet able to understand speech but he is registering the different sounds around him. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you notice in the first few months after the operation? It was very much a question of um, drawing his attention to sound. The first time he actually told me he'd heard something must have been, I think, probably three months down the line. It was a dog barking. We were walking to the post office and the dog was barking behind the fence. And he actually turned to me, couldn't see the dog, obviously, and said, what was that noise? And that was remarkable. Yeah, couldn't believe it. His parents fully understand the cochlear implant is no miracle cure, and they accept that Nicholas won't be talking overnight. What noise? He's had the cochlear implant eight, nine months down the line now. You wouldn't expect a baby of eight, nine months to uh, be talking. But he's trying now to get the words out. Chocolate. Chocolate. Chocolate, yes. Now, Mark, before we get into this, that the that piece of music that they were using there, uh, Accentuate the Positive, mm -hmm. by Bing Crosby and the Andrews Sisters, mm -hmm. do you know that appears in the final episode of two extremely popular TV programmes? Do you know either you of them? I uh one of uh, them we discussed last episode. What was the last episode? <laughs> Sorry, remind me, what was the last episode? <laughs> 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 uh, 
1988. I, I don't know. For one, re- for some reason, I was going to say the X Files was one of them, but I don't know. Go on, tell me. Quantum Leap. It's in the last episode of Quantum Leap, which we mentioned last yep. episode. We did mention that. that yeah, it's very true. And also, it's in the final episode of what I think is possibly the British Quantum Leap. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree that Goodnight uh, Sweetheart is the British quantum leap? Um, like, I mean, I, 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 I kind of know what you mean. Yeah, go on then. All right, I'll give you that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, co- cochlear implants, Mark. Cochlear implants. As, yeah, as, cochlear as, implants. As the lads, was it Nicholas Carter's dad? Ni- was pronounce it? Nicholas Carter. Martin Carter pronounces uh, cochlear. Yes, Nicholas Carter is not which to be is, confused. Which is amusing. There's the little boy here is called Nicholas no. Carter. He's not to be confused with the member of the with Nick Carter. Boys, which is not yeah. the same person, although they are both blonde. Yeah, so uh, I was I remember finding out about cochlear cochlear implants and thinking, what a remarkable um, development! It's like real proper sort of. It seems quite futuristic. When when a mm. when a disability is you know you know quote unquote cured, it see it seems like a mm. uh, wow. You know, we really are moving ahead with with uh, technology and stuff like that. But uh, obviously, this this segment is at pains to point out that actually there are some people who disagree with the idea of of uh, curing deafness. Although it doesn't. Although I mean, if I watched this segment, I would definitely go. That looks like a great idea. Uh, I don't know who these fools are that suggest that you shouldn't get this done. I thought it was good that they indicated that not everyone's in, in, in agreement with them, in agreement with what's happening. But as somebody who's vaguely aware of the real reasons, I think they did a pretty shitty job of giving the reasons. Because it really, because as you said in your notes, it makes it sound like they're just jealous. Yeah. Oh, they're just jealous. It's like, no, no, it is much, much more sophisticated than that. And it is the idea of like there being a com- the deaf community being a people. And and um, not, the cochlear implant hasn't necessarily worked for everyone and hasn't necessarily benefited everyone. Obviously, we don't know at this point. But it it, it was a much more sophisticated. There, there are much more sophisticated reasons why this is a much more challenging medical breakthrough than than it might seem on paper. And you know, I, I, I'm not 100 percent aware of it, but I, I thought because it, it's weird they even cut to her like in front of his birthday party. And she sounds snide. It's kind of <laughs> odd, isn't it? It's like she's talking about Purcell, Russell. <laughs> I do think it's interesting that she has her because obviously Carol at the beginning um, apologizes for having a croaky voice because she's got a cold or yeah. whatever, and it's yeah. noticeable that she ha- in the voiceover to this she also has yeah. a croaky voice. Yeah, yeah. So that means these things are you know knocked together quite quickly. I found that I thought that was quite interesting to note that, that clearly they they're finished on the day that they then record the studio segment. So like it is kind of you know uh, fresh. Yeah, uh, which was interesting because obviously the, in the VT she's like she's perfectly healthy and she probably filmed it weeks ago. Um, but just to go back to, to that that point though, it's like one of the arguments is that Nicholas Carter can talk and can communicate, and this segment implies that he can't. That, that it's only now with having this cochlear implant will he be able to talk when the reality is he is talking perfectly fine throughout this segment to his parents through sign language yeah. but we don't know what he's saying because we don't speak sign language yeah. and, and and that they don't really touch on that you know they, 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 they kind of say like well you know we're not surprised he, he, you know, he, he can't divine the difference between the different sounds at the moment which must make the world because when you think about watching the segment in that context that poor kid is being bombarded by the most egregious Awful sounds and seemingly <laughs> every turn, either they take him to they take his birthday party, they surround him with other children and take him to a loud pub and then switch on his <laughs> implant. Yeah, and even then they buy them like toys that make this these screeching high pitched. And the first, the first sound he feels that was like, that was the I, weird one, yeah. Weird, absolutely weird. It's like every now and then you see those lovely little videos, don't you? Where like a child, like a little infant, is given glasses for the first time, and like they're kind of they they fight, you know, they they you know, and, and then they open their eyes and, and they see their parents in focus. And there's a lovely moment where they kind of a big grin will go in their face as they as you know, like their ba- even their baby brain is able to to understand that oh, I can now see well, and it's a really beautiful moment. Per Nicholas, <laughs> as, as as when they turn his his implant on for the first time, is bumped by it yeah, it goes, yeah. why did they just like yeah. play i don't know bird song or something like that or or, or a 
ask his mum to say hello. Yeah, yeah. Why, why did they make it sound like they were, they'd connected to the electricity? I don't understand. I don't know. I, like, I, I, you, you wouldn't be shocked if some people reject their implants. I think they do, don't they? It's like because because that's the thing is you know one of the reasons I understand that one of the reasons that you know young infants are so cranky all the time is because one of the things you develop even as a child but you still develop you know it takes time is the ability to switch off and focus on specific impunts that are um relevant and important and sort of kind of drown out you know like if we we all heard and saw like a baby apparently we live in a bloody nightmare (laughs) where every single noise you know but you can switch things off You, you learn to kind of focus and to kind of ignore uh inputs and obviously you 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 know, as as an as a child or an adult, if you if you if, if your implant is turned on, you you can't. And of course, you're not hearing the noises that we hear either. You're hearing kind of electronic version of it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know what he I don't know what he must be hearing. And and like yeah, I, I, it's not surprising therefore when you hear about people who decide not to go down that route after having had the implant and go like no, not for me, mm. I'm out. Mm. Mm. But look, uh, though I suppose equally, it must be nice to have the option to switch off the world. Well, exactly. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be useful. Um, yeah, you'd save a fortune on earplugs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd say my think about the flights. My 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 cousin Sally, she hasn't she hasn't got co- cochlear implants, but she's got hearing aids, and uh, she was saying that they're brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant these days because they've got they've got Bluetooth in them, so she can uh, oh. not only does that oh. to help her obviously hear normally, but she can answer her phone and listen to music through them as well, like as wow. if they're headphones. Yeah, that sounds great. That does sound pretty good. Got <laughs> the way ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's 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 uh, talk about sorry, the important yeah. path. I don't know. I just it, it, it slightly the tone slightly annoyed me in this one. But anyway, yeah. sorry. Go on. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the important part of this, yes. Mark, and that is Martin Asukata's perfectly matching jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just write that down for the Instagram. Yeah. They they are per- oh they're wonderful aren't but they they are I don't I don't know what you would call that that's not stonewashed it's like the denim is a untuned television isn't it it's like a sort of like a yeah yeah I see what you mean yeah interference static yeah like a yeah. static it's like yeah. static it's the, denim their their denim is the is the background sound of the big bang <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah but they are perfectly matching like they 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 they've come off the 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 same sewing machine yeah is that yeah. deliberate. Did they buy his um, and her jeans? I I hope so. I like that. <laughs> I keep trying to persuade Josie for us to wear matching clothes at some point because I think it'd be amusing. But I don't think they're doing it for laughs. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe they're just the same, exactly the same jean size. They just they just have wear each other's jeans. I don't know. Could be the case. He looks like he might be sold. And I I just like um I don't know. I see. I assume just I'm going to assume Sue went out shopping and there was a two for. I like, sold it. Might as well. It's really sweet though. It is. It is quite adorable. Yeah. <laughs> You ever wear the same jeans as someone else, Russ? Not, no, I don't think so. I mean, I mean, well, I mean, jeans are jeans, aren't they? Do you think jeans will ever? Do you think jeans will ever go out of? Because surely they're the item of clothing that has remained most consistently fashionable of uh, all time. Yeah, probably. I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't wear them, and I don't have any jeans. Partly because I just despise how appalling they are when it rains, <laughs> and I've never understood how people are so comfortable with the idea of wearing jeans in the rain because the trousers get wet. And then they dry quite quickly, yeah. and then you're not wet anymore. Whereas, like, it can rain, and you could be wearing that rain for the rest of the day. <laughs> and people just seem to be like, oh, well, that's just the price I pay for wearing jeans. I find that fascinating. But, yeah, no, in general, like, it's interesting because obviously, like, the style of jean does become, does come in and out and fashionable. And that always feels like that's a mean trick played by jeans manufacturers yeah. because in, because you're right and denim is is pretty universal it's like it's there's nothing wrong with it but they do they do trick you by making them different shapes different apparently decades. the uh, apparently the boot cut is uh, absolutely back in back in fashion i heard i so i have witnessed it with my own yeah. eyes i believe quite recently russell yeah there's a lot of 90s stuff is back in it is quite awful walking around Hatton <laughs> and seeing people wear clothes that you know bring back flashbacks to <laughs> when we were going out. Anyway, what we talk about, oh yes, deafness. I'll give you some deaf statistics, Mark. Yep. It's estimated that there are 11 million people in the UK who have hearing loss, which is one in six of the yep. adult population. I'd probably... H- how many How many fish? <laughs> I'd probably count myself as one of those. My hearing is absolutely atrocious. You have, um, you have tinnitus, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I have, I have yeah. tinnitus where there's three different tones going on. That's quite exciting. Oh, is that when you're listening to music, Russell? That doesn't <laughs> Eight million of those are aged over 60 or over, so, you know. Okay. Who cares about them? Um... <laughs> 
6.7 million of them could benefit from hearing aids, but only 2 million people use them. But only 900,000 people are severely or profoundly deaf, and around 12,000 people in the UK have these cochlear implants. Uh, whereas globally, there's around 600,000 people with cochlear implants. So, I mean, it's not a huge amount of them, but I mean, I guess probably you you can only get them in, you know, Western countries. I doubt there's anybody in Africa with a cochlear implant or, you know. No, not many, no. But but also I think it, it, it's, it's obviously, it, it only works for those who have a specific type of deafness where the ear can still register sound or like the, the bits of the ear that work that can then be agitated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, if you, and if you don't have that ability, then the, the cochlear implant provides no benefit to you whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. But I, was I have ex- to say, whenever, whenever I see one out in the street, I, I do always think, and it's a weird thing to say, but I always think like, oh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Like, yeah. To be honest, yeah. Yeah, it might be a spy. Because they're always... I mean, I've seen them, so they're not that good. <laughs> well, they're saying that. They are working. Oh, that's true. They are working on one that you can't see. They've, they've, oh. It's already at the clinical trial stages. The, the, the first one was installed in 2020, and it's totally implantable, so you can't see it on the outside. And that means they can wear, wow. it. They can wear it all the time. They don't have to like, take it off when they go swimming or whatever. And, it, and cool. it can't get damaged or anything like that. But I was quite excited that the... Because I, I only remember reading or seeing about them in the 90s. But actually, they were first invented in 1977. And the man who invented them was a NASA scientist, Mark. Good old oh, NASA. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, he was He was a... He, he designed the um, instrumentation for, for NASA craft. And he just did this as like a like little pet project in his lunch breaks and evenings. Amazing. And um, just studied the ear and used his knowledge of, of instrumentation and put them all together and managed to come up with this idea. And then he just sold the patent to some other people who then developed it into the thing that we have now. And the, fir- and the first one was done in Austria in 1977. So, so they've been around a while, but... They have been around a while, yeah. But I presume, obviously, as years go on and everything gets miniaturised and technology gets cheaper, it becomes more and more, you know, affordable and easier to do. But according to studies, I know you were saying that some people don't like them, Mark, but according to studies, they have found that the vast majority of people once they've had it done, do say, oh, yeah, no, it, it's, be- it's, you know, it's better. It is, it yeah. is, That's cool. It is better. Um, yeah. It's, it's okay, especially if you're an adult and you're making that choice for yourself, then, yeah, cool. Yeah. Deaf, deaf adolescents with cochlear implants attending mainstream educational settings report high levels of scholastic self-esteem, friendship self-esteem, and global self-esteem. Global self-esteem. And they hold mostly positive attitudes towards their cochlear implants as part right. of their identity. Love it. So, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I mean, to hear. if I, I would certainly go for I, I can, I can kind of understand the, the arguments that there's nothing wrong with being deaf. I think some like some there's quite some hard hard line deaf people who say that it's uh, almost like yes. committing genocide that we're getting rid of. Them. Yes, I, I'm aware of the 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 extreme views, but which you know, I think they're for TV. They tend to err that side of it, yeah. which I think is unfair on yeah. the majority of the argument. Which is a bit like it's more a case of like, hang in a minute, you know, actually the deaf community is perfectly fine, and Nick can have a very very good. He can have a perfectly normal. Uh, existence without this and he yeah. would be able to communicate perfectly well so the idea that somehow it's it's quote unquote a cure yeah. is it's a bit offensive i understand that argument but yeah there i i am also aware of the idea that uh rolling this out is is some people would have argued is a bit like genocide which which is crass at best <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean i mean if i needed them i'd get them because we live in a world of the of mostly hearing yes. people it's a bit like yes it's a bit like if everyone had wings and i didn't i mean i could perfectly what you know get around walking around the place but i'd yeah i'd feel a bit you know well i wish i and then if somebody offered me a pair of wings <laughs> I wish I could fly. Yeah, yeah, somebody offered me a pair of wings. I'd go, oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah I love those. Just lastly here, Mark, I've got four famous wearers of the cochlear implant. Oh, exciting. Uh, you've got Millicent Simmons, who's that little girl. Well, I say little girl. She's actually not that little. Um, out of the quiet place. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone's favourite Nobel Prize winner, Malala. Oh, didn't know she had one. Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrino. Mm. And your favourite, US shock jock and now corpse, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> yep, yeah. that's true. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and I, know, I don't know if you watch Great British Bake Off, but I think, uh, doesn't Tasha have a cochlear implant? Oh, I don't watch Bake Off. In, in this year's season. So, uh, yeah, now, now corpse, Rush Limbaugh, indeed. Yeah. 
Yeah, he was lucky. He was the only person who didn't have to listen to his drivel. The thing is, he got he got his fitted in 2021. Then he like died. Oh, it's actually a waste of money. He died not that's, long that's after. A waste he? of money. Yeah, he, wait, last year. Yeah. yeah, he mustn't have had it very long. Do you think he killed him? Oh, hopefully, maybe. Yeah, maybe they put a poison pellet. Yeah, maybe, maybe he, maybe he heard his own radio. Show. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I've been saying this. No, I, no, no, no. It's like it's like. It's like the um, it's like the uh, the uh, Twilight Zone episode where the guy just wants to read and loses his glasses. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh <laughs> couldn't believe what he was broadcasting. The hate. Um, very good. I, maybe I did know Malala had one. Yeah, very good though. Right now onto the onto a Halloween mystery mark. This next segment. Ooh, yeah. Next, Shanaz Pakravan reports from a quiet French village. <laughs> Last off at the Ariane Testing Centre. When the engines for the Ariane rocket are tested, the vital electric cables under the fuel tanks have to survive extreme temperatures. They're protected from this intense heat by an extraordinary new material, developed not by NASA or in the labs of multinational corporations, but stumbled upon here in this small family-run textile company in the village of Montferrier in southwest France. The family firm had been quietly knitting sofa covers for three generations, when by chance a mysterious visiting scientist suggested that they try certain experiments which led to a new material with exceptional flame-proof qualities. Monsieur Didier Royart is the owner of the factory and he has his own way of dealing with skeptics. Now please, and I must stress this, under no circumstances attempt to do anything like this because it really is dangerous. You could set yourself on fire. This unprepossessing fabric is what all the fuss is about. Now it may look like an ordinary old blanket, but Monsieur Royards trusts it enough to hold back heat of up to 700 degrees Celsius from his face. We lost our nerve after only two minutes, although Monsieur Royards wanted to continue his performance. <laughs> nice stunt, but customers want scientific proof. The fabric's main claim to fame is that it resists heat longer than any other fireproof fabric. So we asked for the evidence. Here in their lab, they've been blasting the fabric with gas jets for over an hour. The temperature we've got up front is 1,000 degrees Celsius. The temperature back here is just 40 degrees Celsius, and I've got my hand right up against it. Now, at 1,000 degrees, this test has already been going on for an hour, so you can see it really does work. The big mystery is how. Monsieur Royart isn't saying, but we have some clues. The raw materials are the same synthetic carbon fibers used in other flame-proof fabrics. No secrets there. In here, we're getting warmer. Before spinning, all fibers have to be prepared by cracking, stretching out the raw yarn into fine thread. Just watch how much this red pen line stretches as it goes through the machinery. For the flame-proof fabric, they've modified the process in a way they're not letting on. But there's a noticeable difference under our microscope. These straight strands come from an ordinary flame-proof material, whereas these fibres from the new material are plainly twisted and frayed. One theory is that when the strands are knitted together, the random structure filters out infrared radiation, in other words, heat. It's also possible that when it's knitted, the holes play a part, Good for insulation, bad for heat conduction. In other words, it should be ideal for fire protection. For his final performance, Monsieur Royart required the assistance of the local fire brigade. In that fire, wrapped in a single layer of the material, is a wooden dog kennel, minus dog of course. And protecting us from the fire is another bit of the material acting as a screen. I mean, it really is remarkable because I couldn't possibly get my hand any closer than this. I mean, now it's actually hurting. That's hot. That is hot. But if I move my hand on this side, it just, it, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I have enough confidence to actually be able to put my face against it. But after half an hour in the very heart of the flames, what about the kennel?
Well, the material got torn while the fire was being put out, and here it certainly looks burnt. Um, but let's have a look at the rest of this kennel and see what's, what is there. Et voila. Apart from where there was a gap in the material, it's as if it hasn't seen a flame. Well, this is one of the most odd Tomorrow's World segments I think I've ever I've I've ever seen. Not in its presentation necessarily, mm. but in the way in the way they speak about what's going the way that Shanaz speaks about what, what it is, in that she doesn't know what it is. And the, the key element to it, I think, is the fact that apparently this this small French textile factory, a mysterious stranger turned up. Can, can I quote what's said? Yes, yeah, yeah. When by chance a mysterious visiting scientist suggested they try certain experiments which led to a new material with exceptional flame-proof qualities. That's what, what? By chance a mysterious visiting scientist suggested they try certain experiments. Like the... What? <laughs> We've all seen Star Trek 4, Mark. In Star mm. Trek 4, what happens? They need some they need some transparent aluminum to make their tank for the whales. Obviously transparent aluminum has not been invented, invented in 1980s yeah. America. So Scotty goes along to uh, a glass manufacturer and gives them the formula for transparent aluminum in return for them building some for him. Is this not just essentially what's happened here? Was this man a time traveller? Uh, but you know I have I have a different theory because <laughs> Star Trek Four did not pop into my head. This to me sounds very very simple, and that is that Mr. Monsieur Didier has clearly made. So so let, let, let's let's break this down. So we have somebody who turns up randomly, a gentleman, yeah. a mystery traveller who clearly requires some kind of flame retardant material because wherever they are normally <laughs> is extremely hot. Yeah. I I think it's very clear that this French man made a Faustian pact. And is trying to hide this from us <laughs> with appalling levels of effort. He, he made he made a deal with the devil, Russ. He went down to Georgia and he got his flame retardant material <laughs> for a man who clearly needs to make suits that you know can take a licking. I suppose from the flames. I suppose if you get, but also if you if you make a deal with the devil, the best thing you can make a deal for is some kind of flame retardant material because you could just oh, 100%, strap yeah. that on as soon because he it's the, the trick isn't it? This, this man this man has. Has got himself some. He's even got flame retardant headwear, Mark. That's that's <laughs> no two ways about it. He does. Sh should we should we discuss this? Because <laughs> so, so there we were talking about how over-engineered uh, Howard's uh, scuba helmet was, but actually it makes sense so that we could understand what he was saying, and it was nice that that happened, and it wasn't eighty yard. And and you think that's it, and, and then and then you meet this Frenchman who's wearing a double-breasted uh, blazer with uh, brass buttons, the likes of which I assume you now mandatorily have to wear around here. <laughs> yeah, of course. Village. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, he then proceeds to put on this magnificent homemade, what would you call it? Like skeleton helmet? I don't know. This yeah. kind of metallic helmet that goes over his head. It reminds me of um, the Nicolas Cage remake of Wicked. Oh, Man, yeah. The bees, the, the bees. The bees. The oh, the bees. So it's, it's exactly like that. And he just, he just he's standing there smiling with this, this kind of metal frame wrapped around his body. Like, like. It's like like in the Saw films, I suppose it must be the prototype before they actually put in like the traps. Yeah, yeah, and it's and, and he's desperate for them to like blast his face with as much fire as possible. Oh, and obviously, absolutely. BBC's safety they standards, out, don't they? they, they yeah, out. they out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after, after two minutes, which actually is quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a bizarre image, isn't it? Like just this this smartly dressed sort of man. He's probably in his clearly six, French man. Yeah, in his sixties yeah, 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 or yeah. you know something like that. Um, just getting his. Trying, they're trying to melt his face off with a blowtorch. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's such an odd piece. But so yeah, it's, a, it's it's a company that made sofa covers for three generations. Suddenly, are making a material that is used in the European Space Program and by the mm. French Fire Brigade. Yes, that's quite a leap because because I was saying it's like I, I quite like stories like this. Do we all? I think quite like stories where like a little family business ends up doing something that kind of 
elevated them into the stratosphere of like engineering and all of a sudden because I was saying I was recently watching a video where I learned that uh, quite a lot of the signages for TFL not just the underground but also the Elizabeth line and the overground are all made by a factory a, a family run factory in the Isle of Wight who started off making little heaters little kind of you know uh, heaters for ha homes and tractors for like and um, they needed stuff enameled because apparently that, that's really effective. You know, you know, a lot of those kind of wood burning heaters are all enameled on the outside. And rather than kind of getting it sent off, they decided, oh, we'll set up our own enameling business so that we can service this, uh, you know, our main core. And it turned out that whatever they had done was the perfect combination of materials to make signages for TFL. And now they make signs for TFL and the Paris Metro. But that's only their side project because they're still a wood burning stove company. <laughs> And I think that's just brilliant. And the thing is, you watch that story and it makes perfect sense. You can see how yeah, they're yeah, yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like they're proud and like in their offices, they have they have this fake platform that they can show people. So people fly all over the world to see the TFL signs that are being made. Because And, and that's the other thing I, I, I learned. Is that when, you, when you're when you standing on a platform in the underground and you see one of those huge signs, one of those huge maps of the line that show where you are and show all the lines and all the different blah, blah, blah. Not only is, is that, you know, kind of sheets of kind of very specially made enamelized metal, they're all screen printed by hand. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not, it's not printed. It's like there is a guy whose job is to screen print them. He's like an expert screen printer. Every single sign wow. you see on this platform, they've all been screen printed by hand. It's incredible. What it isn't is couched in utter mystery <laughs> and intrigue that belies clearly some kind of devilish deal. Yeah, yeah. That, that will see him and us as observers condemned yeah. i have no doubt and so everything shana's is saying is it's like speculation she's like going well we don't really know what it's made of but we think it might be this and it's just this yeah. constant just this just mystery upon mystery and it just and by the end we're none the wiser apart from the fact that this stuff clearly works and works really bloody well like it's, yeah. it's genuinely impressive Right. And, but, the, and the, but the other thing that really was mysterious, you know, it is very impressive, assuming it's all real. And the thing is, we have to assume because they can't tell us it's all real. And, like, and Shanaz is incredibly convincing. Like she seems gobsmacked that she's able to kind of touch the one side of this thin material whilst on the other it's thousand degrees, which, you know, you would be, you would be impressive. The thing that really got to me, though, is like normally when you see these little things like we've invented this new incredible material and we'll show you an experiment they have a tiny little segment because whatever yeah, it is yeah, yeah. is so new or expensive or difficult to make that they only can really afford to give you a small amount yeah. so then they have shoots <laughs> of this stuff can, just can, lying around can roll you off a whole set of curtains out yeah. of it if you want yeah yeah, yeah yeah so so why russell then are we not all wearing this all the time <laughs> The weird thing is, this is the second time that Tomorrow's World has had a mystery flame retardant substance on it. And I won't go into this too much, but very famously, a few years before this, there was a substance on this on Tomorrow's World called Starlight, which had been manufactured by just some bloke in his kitchen, which was which had wowed everybody because you it, it was like laser proof, like blowtorch proof, and everything like that. And then no one was ever able to find out what it was. So, but I won't go into that because I'm sure we'll cover that episode. Mm at mm -hmm. some point in the future. But but it seems like, yeah, Tomorrow's World has this amazing ability to uncover mysterious flame-retardant uh, substances that no one ever... <laughs> and, and much like Starlight, I couldn't find anything about this anywhere. Really? No, nowhere. That's and incredible. I mean, I was, I was hampered by the fact that there was not really many like, identifying things i because I, I couldn't i couldn't really work out what shannas was saying when she said the name of the village mm, or like agreed uh, um his surname or his surname i tried some yeah. different variations of what i thought i could hear but none of them made any sense i even searched google maps for textile factories in southwest france wow russell that's impressive I yeah <laughs> i was up quite late doing this above, above and beyond yeah and <laughs> nothing i couldn't find anything i could find i i mean i found all sorts of different flame retardant materials i mean they've got loads of stupid names obviously as famous as kevlar but then there's technora twaron heracron nomex tigernaconex vectran inegra this new star kermel kermel is french but it definitely wasn't invented by this guy because it was invented by some other company in the north so yeah this one will remain a mystery, Mark. I don't wow. know. I don't know whether it's still used or whether it's you know whether this this entire segment's completely made up. I 
I mean, it's not April Fool's time, so so no, we, that, yeah. that was that, I that, that was that was the thing. It's like I was looking, thinking, like, you know, what if what if this was a joke? Or and the other thing that really confused me, you just reminded me because you were saying, like, she, she describes how it's used in like the base of where the rockets are launched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Ariadne, and I was thinking, like. What what naked cables are lying around? That need to be wrapped <laughs> I just love. In I like the idea that they've just got like a regular PC set up on a trolley, and they just yeah. they just sling a blanket over it while they're on the rocket. Yeah, course. there we go. All right, Quee, are you ready, Quee? Yeah. I just couldn't understand it. It was like, no, no, I'm sure there. I'm sure like I'm sure there's no cables not display available for the heat to get to <laughs> at all because they're all like you know uh, 500 meters away. Anyway, yeah, I'm. Do you know, I I am. Um, I, I cannot explain how profoundly satisfied I am that you found nothing about this whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, listeners, if any of you know anything, oh, anything about yeah, this, bloody hell. or if you can understand what Shannon is saying when she's pronouncing oh, yes, the name yes, of that yes. village, or if you yeah, know the, anything, yeah. please, please be in contact and tell us. I would love to know. Um, Ever since I saw this, it has been bugging me mm. as, as to how, as you say, ha- how it's couched in tones of mystery. And to the point where it's like, it's almost like, to me, I'm, I'm just delighted we saw it. And I'm deli- absolutely chuffed to bits. It, it, to me, it, it completes the circle that you found nothing about. It. It's <laughs> like, yeah, okay. We, we can actually put it to rest in a way that I, I think if you had learned more, I think it would have been unsatisfying. But it, it, like, it's borderline unbroadcastable to a program like Tomorrow's World that is supposed to be telling you how these things yeah. come about. Like, otherwise, it's just... Well, it is like how or something like that. Like it is a child's program where it's like, look at this magical thing. It's like, but I don't want magic in tomorrow's world. Do you th- I, I need to trust that aerial future actually will do what it says. Well, I can only assume that either, th- I mean, depending on which which of our which of our theories is correct, either <laughs> time, other time travelers came back and corrected corrected the mistake and removed yeah. it from the timeline, or yeah, that's true. The devil came to collect. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's one of those two options, isn't it? Yeah, both of which make perfect sense, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy with that. All right, next one. Well, now something for those of you who are nervous about flying. It's the very latest in aircraft safety, and it was invented by an American. As soon as Jack Britton bought himself a new microlight, he decided to take it for a quick spin. His friend videoed the flight for posterity, and everything was going wonderfully, until suddenly, disaster struck. Oh, shit. Pull the chute. Pull the chute. Come on, Jack. Pull the chute. What happened, uh, uh, I was doing an inverted spin, and I guess I pulled too many Gs negative, and the wing failed. Uh, it was uh, 1,400 feet high when, it, when the uh, failure occurred. Uh, I think I, it was probably about three seconds, and I fired the chute, and uh, here I am. 81 lives have already been saved thanks to Microlite parachutes. Now, the parachutes don't need to be much bigger than normal because Microlites, as the name suggests, are very light. But an American engineer, Boris Popov, wondered if it might be possible to apply this plain parachute principle to much bigger aircraft. And here's the result. This is a Cessna 150 weighing almost a tonne. Three, two, one. Everything is open and looks pretty good. This was only a test flight, and so before the plane hit the ground, the parachute was released and the engines restarted. But this is what would have happened if the plane had parachuted all the way to the ground. It's not exactly a gentle landing, but better than the alternative. A pilot should survive this sort of impact without serious injury. Now, you were pretty um, dismissive of this, this this particular one, weren't you, Mark? You didn't really seem to float your boat no, or fly, no, fly really. your parachute. It, it didn't really. Uh, also, like, there was a couple of things that just like to me were a little bit like amber flags. One was like, all the footage seems like it's 10, 15 years old. It's I I know micro lights have had parachutes on them for a while. It's like and uh, and it's kind of missold. It's like it this not if you're scared of flying, this is not going to help you at all. I no I just I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't buy what was being sold here. It felt like filler, Russ. I don't, it just doesn't feel like it's a new thing anyway. Have you not have, have you not all just idly thought about why don't they put parachutes on airplanes? I've always thought that. 
I, no, I suppose I always assumed they'd be too big. Like, like I suppose in my head I was thinking like, well, you know, think of how big a parachute is for a person. Think of how big it would need to be for a jumbo jet. Think about how then, therefore, you now need to store this one big parachute or lots of mini parachutes on your jumbo jet. Therefore, increasing the size of the jumbo de- jet. Therefore, requiring additional parachutes for all the... No, I just thought it just doesn't make any sense to me. I just think that if you're going to crash, you're going to die. It's as simple as that. Really. <laughs> look... look. Well, I'll um, see you on the other side, figuratively or literally. <laughs> we're pleased to hear, Mark, then, that uh, Ballistic Recovery Systems, which is the company that makes these parachutes, is uh, still trading and is a massive, massive success. <laughs> uh, uh, great. You know, I'm glad that they have tiny parachutes and, you know, sorry, parachutes and tiny planes. That's that's uh, that's fabulous. Uh, they, it, but wh- wh- when were they invented, Russ? Were they invented in uh, September 1994? <laughs> no, no. As we are led to believe. So the company was formed in 1980 by Boris Popov. He gets mentioned, he's not, although he's not featured. Yeah, he's not featured, but he's mentioned, yeah. He invented Boris it, basically yeah. fell out of a hang glider in 1975 and thought, I've, I don't want to invent a parachute that maybe stops people falling out of light aircraft and dying. So the first one, that he, he fitted it to a microlight, and the first person to be survive uh, a crash using his parachute was in 1983. But then, in 1998... A light aircraft manufacturer called Cirrus uh, collaborated with him and they invented a thing called the Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, which is fitted to all of Cirrus's aeroplanes. The Cirrus aeroplanes look a bit like, um, kind of like those sort of crop duster type aeroplanes, you know, that sort of oh, okay. size, yeah, that yeah. kind of size aeroplane. Yep. All yep. 9,000 of those have a parachute on them now. So that's that's good. Cessnas, there's a lot of Cessnas now have this parachute on them. You've heard of a Cessna, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Why, whenever it says light aircraft, it's always a Cessna, isn't it? I don't know why. Mm. I don't know why you'd want Cess in the name. Um, I think it's quite quite a nice word to pronounce it, Cessna. Cessna. Cessna, yeah, yeah, I guess so. But as of 2022, more than 35,000 parachutes have been um, fitted to different aeroplanes and aircraft. And, it is, and the website of their company has a counter on it of how many lives they've saved. They've saved 473 lives as of uh, yesterday. And in 2016, they managed to fit one to a small jet plane. And in 2022, that saved the lives of three people in a jet plane. So there you go, Mark. You may be poo-pooing I, 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 it. Hang on, Russell. No, again, I was not poo-pooing the product. I was poo-pooing the idea. Like, I, this, this, this was not invented in the last year as this program was broadcast. So what the hell is it doing on this show? It is a good point, Mark. They, 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 I saw, That's what I'm poo-pooing. I didn't see anything 94. No, I didn't see 1994 mentioned at any point in my yeah. research. Um, no, or 90, even 93, no. you know, it's all, you know, this 1980, you know, like it's a great idea. And if it had just been invented, I would have gone like, oh, gosh, that's a great idea. But it's very clear because even even the film footage they show of what would happen if the plane landed, apparently completely flat on its tires. It, it, it clearly is from the 80s or 70s. Well, 80s probably, I suppose, in this case. But like it's just it's film. I don't know. That's what bothered me, Russell, as you know, as well, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to make me sound like I want everyone in planes to die. Well, all I'm saying, if you change your tune, Mark, and you see the light and decide to fit one of these parachutes to your aeroplane, one of your fleet, yep. you, you know, your squadron that you own, uh, it's yep. you about back about fifteen grand. So that's something to okay. I mean, that seems like that's good value, to be honest. Yeah. Next one. Well, giving birth can be extremely painful. Believe me, I know, and that's why a lot of women opt for an epidural. The price you pay is that your body is numb from the waist down and you can't walk. Now this leaves some women feeling like bystanders at the birth of their own child. Baby Anna is just three weeks old, but her mother had a controversial new type of epidural that seems to have achieved the impossible. Pain relief without temporary paralysis. Vivian Parry was there. Lindy Hurst is just about to give birth. An hour ago, the pain of the contractions became unbearable, but what she had was no ordinary epidural. On almost any other labour ward in any other hospital, you won't see a woman able to walk around after an epidural. Oh. Three hours earlier, as the contractions began, Lindy was in severe pain. With her first baby, she had a conventional epidural, and initially, the new one is identical. What we'll do is get you to lie on your side, uh-huh. and then um, we spray with some cleaning solution, and you curl up like a little ball, and we just uh, put some local anaesthetic in, and pop the epidural needle in. Ooh, that's 
Giving an epidural is a skilled and delicate procedure. The anaesthetic has to be injected right into the spine. That's the only way to numb all the nerves that relay the pain. Keep still now. Okay. A needle is delicately inserted in the small of the back between two vertebra. With a conventional epidural, the needle stops short of entering the spinal fluid. Because the anaesthetic has to get through all the fat and blood vessels surrounding the nerves, a relatively large dose has to be used, which knocks out everything, including the motor nerves which control walking. Now, I had epidurals with my babies, and I can tell you they really do work. But there's a downside. Your legs go like lead, you're strapped to the bed, and you're wired up to all sorts of monitors and equipment, and you really don't feel in control of things at all. With the new epidural, a very fine needle will be fed through the standard needle right into the spinal fluid. Here, the nerves are more exposed, just floating free in the fluid. So a much smaller dose of anaesthetic can be used, which hopefully will block the pain-sensing nerves without knocking out the motor nerves. OK, Gary. This is the moment that's controversial. You might feel a sharp prick in your back. Keep still, don't move. Okay. <gasps> oh! well done. Many other hospitals think a needle should only be put into the spinal fluid in an emergency because there might be long-term side effects. Getting the dose just right so she can still walk is far from easy. It doesn't work every time. I feel warm. Yes. And then stand up for a few minutes and see how you feel. Okay. How's that? Fine. Good. That's great. Okay. Here at Queen Charlotte's in London, the walking epidural gives women like Lindy freedom in the final hours of labour. Epidurals, Mark. You ever had an epidural? I have not, Russell. No, I haven't. <laughs> no. I, I often ask for them and I am refused. Really? Yeah, which I think is <laughs> you don't, poor. You don't, you don't, what, Customer you don't, is always right. You Russ. don't waddle into the hospital wearing a gown with a pillow stuffed up your front. Okay. <laughs> well, not anymore. <laughs> I mean, I've got to say, I mean, obviously, I have never ever given birth, and I am unlikely to give birth. But if I were going to, I'd be, I'd be asking for every single drug they had in the hospital, like just pump me full of whatever you've got, left, right, and centre. I mean, yeah, that's that's just any yeah, yeah. any weak knife, isn't it? Russ? <laughs> But I would have to say, I would feel pretty squeamish about the whole concept of somebody injecting into my spine. Yes. There is something weird about that, isn't there, that makes you feel a bit icky. And yeah. I'm also aware it's very dangerous, which they allude to in that segment. And I'm also, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you, because I'm also very concerned about the fact that really, they hadn't done any analysis of, of what the long-term effects of what she chose to do to herself, or get done to her will we'll end up so there's a lot about this I i'm uncomfortable with but probably and like, probably less uncomfortable than she was yeah, in the first. exactly at which yeah, point yeah. it's like well really you know I'm, I'm happy for her to decide yeah old mindy i mean she's very game mindy yeah. isn't she you know oh, i mean i wouldn't i, I wouldn't want to be featured on television you know look huffing and puffing and but no, it was, it was, it was Lin lindy wasn't it lindy, oh, was it lindy? i thought it was mindy lindy so, yeah oh, no no lindy, lindy yeah oh. yeah i seen belinda Obviously, I was looking for Mindy, so that, oh, that's yes, why I, I was about to say that means that's what you found nothing yeah, about yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, notably, her husband is also wearing a turquoise polo shirt, which um, yes, indeed, which, mean, which means the that the British Empire was very much the sort of taste maker in in uh, men's fashion in 1994. Which I, I mean, well, Colin was cutting <laughs> edge, wasn't he? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's not a huge amount. Of, I think this, the problem with this segment is it's it's quite a lot of filler, isn't it? It's like yeah, this is something that could have been explained by uh, Judith in the studio with a with a model in about two minutes. Because all they're doing is they're doing the, it's the same procedure, but they're just injecting the whatever the anaesthetic is in a different part of the spine. Is that's that's all that's happened, really, isn't it? So this is allowing them to yeah. be able to walk around rather than completely wiping out their lower half, which is what what the, the the regular epidural does. There are a few things in this episode, particularly from this segment and also then from the Nicholas Carter segment, 
there are, especially when you rewatch several times like you and I do, where it's like, it feels like the show was under, was running under, and they had to add things back in just to fill it up. So with the Nicholas Castle one, there's a whole thing where A, the teacher for the deaf, goes into laborious detail about the sounds and teaching them, and we see the process, which actually, you don't need to show it, you just need to tell no. us. And then we also see Nicholas and her and her playing a game, and you see, he's, he, like, they do it seven times, which is like, you don't need to see it twice. There's a few things where they've kind of added in, or left stuff in, because I think they needed to fill time. And then with this one, there's a Lindy Hurst has an entire conversation with another expectant mother in this hospital yeah, in Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. And that is got nothing to do with anything. I mean, it's nice, it's fun, but like it's actually has it's completely irrelevant to the piece. And the, yeah, there were a few moments like that where it's like again, you, we don't need to see half of what we do to understand what's going on. Her lived experience is interesting, mm. but again, it, it, it's it's um, borderline felt exploitative of the Hursts yeah. by the end of it. <laughs> yeah, and it did. I mean, and obviously this is the last last uh, segment of the episode. And I got to get to the end. I think, wow, was that, is that it? Like. It's only five, mm. only five segments. Five segments, and yeah. I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't feel as info packed as as a you know as a previous yeah. episodes that we've watched. Oh, we, we've had episodes where we've. I think we've had ten or eleven different. Yeah, segments. exactly. Um, yeah, or, or in almost like a data blast at the end of a TV program. Yeah, yeah. You know. Funny, if I looked at my spreadsheet, I do not track the number of segments on a show. It's one right. of the few things I don't track. <laughs> so, I, But it definitely feels like there is less to it. Having said that, like, I do like it when they allow, allow it to breathe. Yeah. But the problem with that is that if there is nothing to tell, hmm. like you don't know whether the devil came to France to give somebody... Because <laughs> that's a story I want to hear about. Uh, or time travel. Or uh, um, w- with this one, like there, there, there just isn't quite enough no. to kind of fill that gap. It does make it feel a bit woolly, ironically, for the French one. But it does make it feel <laughs> yeah. a bit woolly, yeah. Yeah. And obviously it's Vivian Parry again and Plinky Plonky sentimental music at the beginning. So mm. mark them down for that. Vivian Parry must love hospitals, I guess. I mean, love the smell of mm. disinfectant or something. I don't know. She's always bothering people in hospitals. Hospital botherer, as you said, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, epidural. The epidural actually refers to the the part of the the space around the spinal cord it's not the name of the procedure uh the first the first ever epidural recorded was in 1885 when american neurologist james corning inadvertently injected 111 milligrams of cocaine into the spine into the epidural space of a healthy male volunteer bloody hell stop <laughs> inadvertently, inadvertently he's doing a lot of heavy lifting there but yeah then then actually deliberately doing them there was a spanish military surgeon called fidel Pajes who in 1921 realized it was a good way of stopping the pain in injured soldiers who had their legs blown off or whatever and then some in 1931 a romanian surgeon called eugen aburel realized oh this should be good in childbirth there are some people who worry that because it numbs the whole lower half of of the mother that it might you know somehow make them need a cesarean more but they've done mm. studies and it's this is not true at all right it, there's no correlation uh, between the two so that means in developed countries over 70 percent of births involve an epidural and i looked on the mhs website and they specifically mention a thing called a mobile epidural which allows you to walk around while you know in labor so it seems mm-hmm. to me that this thing has come through and, and i mean it's very it's, it's mentioned very nonchalantly as if it's a thing that lots of people do so i assume that it's something that's been adopted amazing the other the other thing that the nhs website said was um uh, do not drive operate machinery or drink alcohol for 24 hours after having an epidural which made oh, me, okay <laughs> which just made me think of like uh, some mother just like dump dumping the baby on the husband getting in the car driving to the building site driving a jcv then going down the pub afterwards <laughs> for a few a few short ones yes before getting home think, to see uh, the baby again that does feel like unnecessary warnings <laughs> unnecessary warnings yeah uh, but yeah, I mean that's that that is the end of this episode. Mark, it's come around all too suddenly. Oh, I, the the only thing I wanted to add, actually, not even the segment, is that um, and I had completely forgot this. There's a little teaser at the end for next week's show. Oh yeah, and she and she talks about Monty Don doing a VT, and I had completely forgotten yes. he ever touched Tomorrow's World. Yes, he was a very briefly, yeah, very briefly a presenter. I don't think he was on it for very many episodes. And I suspect that all of his things were plant based. <laughs> One assumes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always That's wears a lovely jumper. Always to got a lovely point. jumper on, isn't he, Monty Don? Uh, he, he does. He, he looks very cozy. Yeah. He's a cozy looking presenter. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah so, so that was it, really. Yeah. Perfectly fine episode, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, the the yeah. thing that made it the thing that made it for me was that that mystery 
That's incredible. That will live long in my, and it'd be, it'd be one of those things that I, I yearn to solve for the rest of, for however, for however long we're doing this podcast, I yearn to solve that mystery of whether that thing exists. Yeah. Well, thanks to your um, Dutch, you know, Brexit card, you, you now can actually <laughs> spend as much time in the Just South scouring of South as, France. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which unfortunately is not an option to you know, available to many of oh, our listeners. For us. If, if only they could join you on these trips. <laughs> Right, shall we? Uh, yeah, shall we? Shall we get get our uh, number crunches out? Flame retardant uh, adding machine, and then have an entirely uh, yeah, and then have an entirely non-number based audit session. All right, let's go. So, um, cinema box office, Russ, tell us all about it. It's a beauty. It's a beauty. Number ten. Clear and present danger. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, I've seen that. Number nine, The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Number eight, The Browning Version. I have not seen that. What's that? Mike Figgis. Mike Figgis, mm. Albert Finney, Greta Skaki, Matthew Modine, Michael Gambon. Okay. I mean, it's got, that's a it's very got impressive Finney and Gambon cast. in it. That's, um, yeah. Yeah. Number seven, Speed. Okay. Uh, okay. See that? Have you seen that? Number six, The Flintstones. <laughs> yep, saw that. The ABC, Tunbridge Wells, Russ. Yeah. Number five, Fabulous. The Client. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. I do yeah. like. I do like this. That sort of. I, you do? I, I, no, but I, I just do like the fact that there was like proper. Oh big, yeah. Big blockbuster um, legal dramas. Yeah, yeah. Grisham, the Grisham thing. Yeah, yeah. Or days. Runaway Jury, Pelican Brief, yeah, all yeah, these yeah, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Number four, Major League Two. Nope, not seen. Number three, Forrest Gump. Oh, yeah, definitely saw that. Number two, <laughs> Pulp Fiction. That's what that was? Yeah, 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 yeah. I genuinely, th- honestly, I thought Deliverance had been re-released, which is what you were about to be saying. <laughs> you thought, me, okay. you thought I, I was doing the Swamp Thing thing again. Um, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. And number one, The Lion King. Oh, wow. Never seen it. Wow, still still going in October. It's very good, Russ. You should see it. <laughs> Cool. I mean, a lot, right. a lot um, of heavy hitters in that, isn't there? Yeah, that's big. Yeah, not least because, like, well, well, so, yeah, just before Halloween, like, some of those must have been out in the summer. Like, Speed and The Lion King must be summer releases, so they're still around, hitting heavy. Anyway, pop chart, Russ. Now, October 94, I, come on. I only ever had one, now that's what I call music, and it was definitely Ooh. the one that, that came out, out now, now because almost all of, the, you recognize. Almost all of these are on it. <laughs> Number yeah. 10, Stay, I Missed You by Lisa Loeb and Nine Stories. Number nine, mm-hmm. yep. When We Dance, Sting. Oh, I don't know that one. Eight, oh, Welcome to Tomorrow by Snap featuring Summer. Uh-huh. Number seven, Hey Now, Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Cindy Lauper. Mm. Uh, and it's only weirdly recently that I realised that she's singing a bit from that other song, which they feature heavily in Guardians of the Galaxy. It goes, Hey Now, Hey Now, oh, What's the gotcha. Matter With That one. Which yeah. Girls called. just to wanna have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. I, no, you're right. You're, I can see how. Yeah, it does flow, doesn't it? Uh, number six. She's got that vibe. R. Kelly. Number five. Sweetness. Michelle Gale. Oh wow. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, number four. Sweetness. Sure. Take that. Number three. Always. Bon Jovi. Number two. And this, 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 this is really. This absolutely hammers the nail in the in the date. Yeah. Saturday Night by Wigfield. Wow. So we're in a post-wet, wet world, are we? And number one, Baby Come Back by Pato Banton. Baby Come Back. Very good. Tell me about the prices, Russ. Well, this is an interesting one this this time because... A, a, a good admission that it's not always interesting. I like that, Russ. <laughs> That's important. It's a little bit different. I managed to find a news article from the Manchester Evening News. Headline Manchester. Headline is Unearthed 1994 Tesco receipt reveals <gasps> some surprising prices. <gasps> I think I remember this article. Go on, yeah. I'm impressed that the receipt is still readable because they normally fade over time. That they, fade, I mean, yeah. anybody who's ever to file their own had their own file their own taxes knows that. But yeah, so this Tesco receipt, lovely old Tesco logo on it. It has. It's not much. It's not much of a shopping list, but here we go. Four pints of milk, 84 pence. Wow, that's so cheap. Bag of self-raising flour, 72 pence. No idea, that's cheap. Uh, Table salt, 38 pence. Mm -hmm. Red Mountain Instant Coffee, 
one pound fifty nine a jar, but it was a buy one get one free. Oh, that's a bargain. And that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting more. Maybe I saw a different different article about a different receipt. That's interesting. There. Okay. Argos catalogue. Well, Mark, it's been it's been a few months. In a few months in the darkness, I feel, but like a phoenix from the ashes. Yeah. This month, the most Amusingly, expensive Amusingly, as kettle. you say this, like you were in an unlit room. <laughs> and it has got darker since you said, go on This then. month, the most expensive kettle. Yeah. Buy, a oh, cl- buy a clear £13 from the competition. £13 more expensive Ooh. than the competition. Is, That's of course, the Russell Hobbs yeah. classic stainless steel cordless kettle. Max capacity, three pints, polished stainless steel body, plastic lid, water level indicator, non step heat, 2,400 watt, BAB. Approved thirty nine pounds fifty, and also Mark. Um, uh, I thought, hang on a minute, I've never actually googled Russell Hobbs. I looked, read their Wikipedia articles. I did that last night. Yeah. Did you know that Peter Hobbs of Russell Hobbs fame is from Langton Green, just outside Tunbridge Wells? No, I didn't Wells. know that. You serious? <laughs> yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And okay. Guess what school? No guess idea. Guess what school he attended, Mark? Did he go to our school? Did he go to tech? No, he didn't. Unfortunately. Oh, thank God. Skinners. He went to Skinners. Dirty skin. Yeah, so boy. I think that means. I and think I, that means. I knew my. I think that means he's a gay lord, Mark. Stank. Does that mean he's a gay lord? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if we can say that now. Right? We, def- we definitely would have said that in the nineties. Yeah. 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 So uh, I don't know how to feel about that. I mean, I'm pleased that he's from where we're from, but then I found out he goes to Skinners. I don't know. Where Skinners. That's, you know, that's, oh, oh, I don't. I don't know that at does all. Does that put me off yeah. Russell Hobbs? And but it's got Russell in the name. Oh, I'm very conflicted. Mm, well, I tell you what, you do if you, you have a Russell Hobbs, don't you? you I've, got multiple, I've, got the multiple, Hobbs bit. I've got multiple Russell Hobbs. Yeah, of course, because Rus- yeah, scratch off the Hobbs. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, do that. Uh, just Russell. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great idea. Do that. Magazine covers Russ. New Scientist. Australia, a paradise for science. And she's got some footprints in the desert. Scientific American might be an interesting issue. This one. Life in the universe, including interviews with Carl Sagan, everyone's Ooh. favorite. That lovely voice of his. Don't know whether mm. that comes through in 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 the text though. In, uh, <laughs> Popular science, very exciting looking picture of a weird looking aeroplane inside the top secret skunk works. Return of the supersonic spy drone. How the self stealth fighter was born. All good stuff. Now, Mark, I'm going to quickly share this one. Time magazine. Oh, okay. I'm going to yep. share this on the shared document. It's a new hope for public schools. Pop this at the bottom here. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. Is that child not see Kyling? <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to load. I can see that you've put some... Oh, wow. And he's wearing a yellow star. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> that is a full-blown Heil Hitler that kid's doing, isn't it? So I don't know uh... whether that's a new hope for public schools. Gosh, that's an uncomfortable picture to look at. Russ. He looks very happy with himself. Yeah, and he's yeah, blondish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In grassroots result, revolt, parents and teachers are seizing control of education. Much like they seized control of Poland. <laughs> um, private Eye, Aitken caught in church shock. There's a lot of speech bubbles here. Uh, there's a vicar saying, did you enjoy the service? Then Mrs. Aitken is saying, is it included? Then Jonathan Aitken is saying, my wife will put some money in the collection plate later. And in five months time, I will make up the balance. This and then, is this related? To, yeah, and on. then there's another voice bubble coming in, in off the side saying it's yeah. an alms deal, as in ALMS. A-L-M-S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite a good pun. I yeah. like that. Is this because he stayed at the Paris Hilton and for free and didn't? No idea. No, oh, gosh, that's I vaguely remember. Fourteen times. Mm. Meet Sister Apocalypse. God put a telescope in her brain. Holy Spirit fever. Catch the glo- new global virus. Plus. Flying hedgehogs, bogus social workers, convict cowboys, and a host of other misfits. I've got to say, flying hedgehogs sounds a lot more Fortean than bogus social workers. To, to, to yeah. My taste. Viz, and for possibly for the first and only time ever, doesn't have their regular Viz logo. They, they are for this. They've copied the Sun logo for some reason, and they've made their front page look like the front page of the Sun. And <laughs> the main headline is "Big Tits Are Back." Uh, <laughs> uh, Fair enough. P- new price sensation. It's twenty p, which is uh, the price of Chinese uh, plastic forks, has gone up. And a uh, five pound snap with Rodney Bues. And new column starts today. Little cock with a uh, slightly deformed picture of Richard Littlejohn. And Playboy girls of the SEC. Now, is there anything other than it called the SEC other than the Securities and Exchange Commission? Exchange Commission. I can't think of anything else for us. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes. Isn't that also a varsity college football conference? Oh, that makes more the sense. Sa- 
Yes, uh, I assume they must be uh, cheerleaders, are they? Oh, I don't know. I don't. I mean, the front cover is a uh, is a lady called Jennifer Lavoy who looks like Gina Davis, but she's wearing yeah. she's wearing a pair of dung dungarees, a denim hat, and she's sitting on a pile of books. Um, okay, I mean, she she could be a member of the SEC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other stories inside are OJ's other woman, uh, Paula Barbieri, Tim Allen's surefire tips how to succeed with women, Playboy interviews Jerry Jones, and Pigskin Preview. Okay, there you go. Great articles. So, let's think about the episode, Russ. And it's interesting because we only have five things. Yeah. One of which was a recap of something that had already previously been invented. The other thing was an entire mystery that we can't <laughs> get our heads around. A third item was something that was actually invented in the 1980s. So, Russell, what was the most important invention of the, uh, of the, of the five things we saw today? I still think it's the cochlear implant. I, I, I do agree. I think it's either that or I think it's the epidural. Yeah. And I'm going to go with the epidural just because I think by my standards, we're not, if we'd seen the segment nine months previously where they talk about the cochlear, cochlear imprint, I would have gone with that. But we're actually seeing, oh, no, that's, no, I'm, I'm being too mean. Yeah, go on then. I agree. Because actually we see that it works, or ish. It'd be fascinating to know how he did a few years later. Yeah, obviously any any searches for Nicholas Castle just gets me that bloke from the Backstreet Boys, unfortunately. Of course, of course it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. I suppose the cynical part of me was also thinking, like, if it had failed, we would never have heard. So I, I wonder if we'll ever come across a segment where they go back and look at something and it hasn't worked. Mm. That would be that would be interesting. But again, that that you know, no pun intended, but that would be parking parking their tanks on our coast. <laughs> <laughs> Most worthless invention. Most worthless invention. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's nothing worthless in this, is there? I mean, even even the tank dumping was like had some benefit. Yeah, no, they're all yeah, they're they're all they're all decent. Yeah. They're, they're all, all fine, they're all aren't they? Yeah. Fine. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and and again, my issue with the plane parachute is not the object itself, Russell. I never said that. I didn't put that in the notes. I wish nothing but good health to all pilots everywhere. It was just that it clearly isn't a new thing. But I, I, you know, I think I don't think there's anything worth this here, is there? No, not at all. No, no, lovely. Well, we can we can carry on with that. Most inaccurate prediction of the future. Sadly, Carol never seems to indicate how long she's going to stay <laughs> in the show. <laughs> I don't think we discussed enough, actually, because I was thinking, like, you know, when when they wrap the doghouse in the fireproof fabric, and obviously the plan is that it will be completely uh, normal when they pull it off. Yeah. But when they do pull off the material, actually, a bit of it got ripped, and so she said it got. Yeah, you know, she said it got ripped in in the while well, being extinguished. In so the it extinguished, it's, it's, yeah, it's completely fireproof, but absolutely incredibly susceptible to fire extinguishers. Which I don't think we discussed that enough. Yeah. Uh, so um, that that was an odd thing, wasn't it? it was like. Because at some point you do have to put the fire out, I suppose. Anyway, yeah. So I, the closest I can think of as a, as a bad prediction was obviously they, they were hoping to show off a completely untouched dog kennel. But the reality was the material was fallible to um, a hydrant. Yeah. Um, so it got ripped. But I, I, there aren't actually a huge amount of predictions of the future that don't come true. Because in a sense, we don't know, really. I mean, obviously, assuming Nicholas Cost is, Nicholas Cost is fine and, you know, has gone on to lead a satisfying life. Because how old would he be? He'd be... Uh, 30, in his 30s, wouldn't four? he? Four? Yeah. Yeah, 34. So, you know, I'm sure, he's, I'm sure he's very happy. So, yeah, actually, there aren't many predictions, so I think we'll probably move on for that one. Uh, worst screw-up? Uh, Carol ruining her career by filming that, that, that advert. I can't, you know, I genuinely, I cannot believe how egregious that ad is. <laughs> it's actually, it's even worse than I thought in my mind. Because in my mind's eye, it was maybe just her in the in a fake studio just pitching the product which is one thing but the fact that she's pretending to go on a journey to find out for herself whether the evidence oh i don't know that's i can't believe i can't believe she thought that was okay yeah oh, amazing fair i wonder how much she got paid for it so yeah we'll go with that one best attempt at making something boring interesting surely a french businessman trying yeah. to set fire yeah. to his own face yeah a sofa manufacturer yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's absolutely true. I can't, it's amazing that you can't find anything out about that. Uh, best use of music. I know you're going to go with the thing, but uh, the swamp by the thing. Yeah. No. And go on. I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, acquiesce. Uh, I did like um, when Johnny goes marching in, just because I quite like. I I, I actually I'm going to say that does suit the fact that their tanks going into yeah. the water more. Yeah, I, I thought that was that that was quite fun, and uh, so and you, it reminded I, me of no, Die Hard. All right, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. You're right. All right. Right. I win that round. Yeah. Brilliant. Best or worst use of furniture? There's not a huge amount of furniture in this. 
Um, no. Obviously, there's the stool that Carol's sitting on in the studio, yep. uh, and then there's the horrible three piece suite that the, oh, the, yeah, the Carter yeah. family is sitting on. Yeah, um, that's about it, really. I think, uh, or, or, uh, I mean, or I st- unless unless you count the fact that it's a sofa cushion factory. I was I was going to posit that as a possible use of furniture, but I think that might be a bit too much of a leap. So uh, yeah, let's go with that one then. <laughs> Most notable clothing? It's got to be the the matching uh, Geordie jeans. Of, um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Geordie jeans, <laughs> of course, is matching Ge- Geordie jeans. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what it is. Did we see in the, anything in the episode that made it through to the future? Uh, you know, I, obviously we did. We did. You know, I, I, it is good to know that. It, it, it's interesting. Walking epidural, which is what it's referred to throughout that segment, is is not a great name for it. No. Uh, but mobile epidural, obviously, is better. It's good that that is available. The plane parachute has made it through and clearly is being utilised uh, quite broadly. I, spe- I suppose we don't know whether the fireproof fabric has made it through because you can't quite pin it down. Mm. But let's let's go with the concept that has made it through, yeah. and then obviously Nicholas the, the cochlear cochlear implant, and then fake re. So actually quite a lot, quite a big hit rate. Um, and then what does this episode tell us about the twenty eighth of October, nineteen ninety four? Um, BBC can't stop messing with things that work. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Not 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 that Carol Vorderman isn't a perfectly decent presenter, but what she wasn't was a Tomorrow's World presenter. No, no, no. A- and in a sense, I suppose you want a Tomorrow's World. You have to earn your stripes. Shen- you have to earn your time. Bu- yeah, Shen- in the Shen- trenches. Shen- came in. Yeah, was she the first presenter to come in and lead? Yeah, of course. That hadn't. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm trying to think. Was there anyone else who was like a guest presenter who came in? It's like no, they all came in to present Tomorrow's World. And then, you know, worked their way up and became famous through it. Yeah. But never, there was no celebrities that came in. I'm sure they had, like, you know, obviously guest people on, you know, just to sprinkle a bit of stardust. I'm sure we discussed it. But, yeah. Yeah. And it just, I suppose, maybe it does presage the end. Because mm. at that point, then, there's less than a decade left of Tomorrow's World. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and this this is where they do start doing things that we don't like. Like, they don't have anything in the studio. Yeah. They have those horrible title card things, which is that night. They use sentimental yep. music. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's just yeah, and the, the 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 films are less interestingly filmed in yes, general. Yes, yes, you're right. Actually, yeah, they're they're much um drier or and and they're much um what's that they talk, fl- they're flatter, yeah. aren't they? They're like this. Yeah, three weeks into the beginning of the end, who knew? The, the theme the um, theme tune isn't as good as the one that. It, no. Cause, yeah, if that's not because the obviously the previous series had the drum one, which we quite which we quite liked. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at the tropes then. Time to tick off. What we got going on here, Russ? Presenter having to speak over louder sounds? No, I, I, well, no. I mean that's more studio-based stuff, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean Howard Howard raises his voice a bit on the boat, but he's not he's not true. It's no, it's it's not what it's not what it's, it's not just because he's out in the open. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not. which is fair, fair. there's nothing to do with all the rigs. No. There is one suspiciously obvious brand name on the ad-free BBC, which is when Howard directly references McDonald's. Oh, yes, of course he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I thought was, I, I get his point, uh, but at the same time, it's like, it's a very un-BBC thing, I think. <laughs> we, we say that, but obviously it happens every episode, <laughs> so it's not, that, it's not that un-BBC, is it? Clear and blatant lying? Oh, yes, yeah. Oh. The, what's her name? The mother of uh, Nicholas Carter. Yeah. When she is trying to teach him words she's got oh yes she's got, a, she's got a barrel of biscuits in front of her yeah and she's pointing to them all and just saying chocolate yeah. chocolate yeah only 50 percent of those biscuits are chocolate mark yeah so she's absolutely t- and I, I don't know whether nicholas realizes this he might just he might just suddenly start thinking that all biscuits are chocolate well of course he'd be right to do so yeah it's, it's like it's like uh it's like the film dog teeth isn't it it's like are they willfully trying to you know misteach him things so that he will struggle in the inside world yeah that was an odd it was an odd thing it's like yeah yeah very weird um there were no evil farmers no there weren't even any evil fishermen the only casual sexism i can think of is that howard really when he was talking about how obsessed america is with fishing he then went on and he talked about fishermen and fisher women <laughs> yeah, and he did yeah, it yeah. he did it he did it in the 90s way that was like look yeah, but... i know <laughs> ah see some women like to fish too yeah, yeah. look look how equal minded i am i was like no 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 you you no so I, i'm gonna take that because i think that's exactly what it is he's trying to draw attention to how uh unsexist he is which only goes to reinforce how stupidly sexist i do, I do have to is. say though when when i uh read the guardian now and obviously they don't say fishermen they say fishers yeah and it just reads it just reads because yeah yeah they need to they need to come up with another word 
Yeah. Because fishes doesn't sound right. It doesn't roll off the tongue correctly. Fisher, no, fisherman no, it doesn't. Sounds good. So you yeah. need to come up with a word that has that same yeah. cadence to it. Because cadence, fishes, yeah, fishes, with fisher. fisher sounds wrong. It's clunky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it stops too soon. It's like a screeching hole. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. It, it's an awkward sounding word. It's awkward to say as well, even if it is accurate. Um, lab space filled with darkness and coloured light. I can't nope. think of anything. Uh, there were no Dutch angles. Well, apart from the fact that Carol Vorderman's oh. dad's Dutch. I suppose that is a Dutch angle. Yeah. I'll, I'll think about t- t- ticking that later, Ross. And nothing was presented from a gantry. There was a bit. Well, Howard, when he when Ooh. Howard was above the tank, so I couldn't work out oh. whether he was on a gantry or not. He's probably like on the bridge of the boat, yeah. wasn't he? Does that count? No, probably not. Oh no, dad joke from Howard's table fridge. No, he was pretty straight laced this week. He was pretty straight laced, wasn't he? Uh, episodes episode ends in a damp squib i mean from my perspective yes because it was a medical section but um i don't think that actually that section was any worse than any of the, 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 the no it wasn't uh, like uh, yeah, the, the, the the you know lindy had a lovely baby at the end yeah. seemed very pleased with it so i've got no problem with that uh woolard or mccann abroad or common in a small european town no. not really though it'll be interesting going forward for this this nine months as we dip in and dip out of it over the next seven to twelve years <laughs> Uh, how often Howard is not in the studio and has been sent abroad. Is it, for this temporary period, will he be the Woolard or McCann? Yeah, yeah. Um, as you say, w- w- is that the sop they threw his way to kind of keep him on side? Any lasers? Nope. No. Any magnets? Nope. No. Any boats? Oh, oh, oh yeah! <laughs> wow. uh, so the only thing I have to conclude is just to... Oh, Talking about ending in a damn squib, there's nothing I hate more than reminding people how few episodes we have left, Russ. Having watched 34, having covered 34, we have watched more than that. <laughs> having covered 34, we now only have 1,375 left. So, <sighs> oh gosh. But that's it, Russ. That's that episode, all it? We can put that one away. Wow. Well, wow. what else? episode that was. <laughs> mm, one for the memory books. Oh, yeah. But no, seriously, anybody at home, please, if you know oh, anything God. about yeah. that material, I'm desperate to know. Or am I? Or do I want to keep it a mystery? I don't know now. <laughs> no, please tell us. Yes. Yeah, no, do. And, do. and also, if you understand French better than, than I do, which is not difficult because I don't understand any, can you explain what Chanaz is actually saying when she pronounces the name of that village? Then maybe that might help us track it down. Well, that, 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 as I was about to say, you don't even know how to know about the material. You just need to tell us where it's located or his surname because yeah. that might help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we just know where it is, I could just pop down there and just ask around yeah. in the local, was it, yeah. it tavern? Where, 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 where do they drink in? in, in Tobacco. <laughs> Tobacco. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of those markets where we have all the chickens in cages. I know, I know yeah, loads yeah. about France, Mark. My God, Russ, you'll fit, you'll fit in so much. <laughs> Just turn up to every French village on fire and see who puts you out quickest. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Foolproof. Uh, there we go. Well, right, Mark. I'm going to have to leave you now. I've just had a knock at the door. It's one of the uh, one of my neighbours, obviously one of the local fishermen. <laughs> I live amongst fishermen these days. And he's just said he's having trouble. Um, you know, his catches are down. So he's, <gasps> he's, he's asking if he can push my Volvo into the harbour. So, uh, yeah, so... Go and Very help, good. Uh, help him with that, but yeah, we're gonna have to um say goodbye. And uh, next month, obviously, it'll be the 35th episode, so it'll be something special. It's an it's a multiple something of five, special. yep, which we've not decided what it is yet, but I'm sure no, nope. something. Uh, I'm sure we have a quick discussion now, Russ. <laughs> yeah, a quick con yeah, flab, yeah. But until then, it's uh, goodbye from us. And if you are on the internet, we will see you tomorrow. Bye.